This open meeting of the Triton Regional School Committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 and the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings. And as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. <coughs> but, <laughs> further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. I hereby call the order the January 28th meeting of the uh, district um, communications committee at 6 30 p.m. I'm Nerissa Wallen, chair of the Trenton Regional School Committee, and I would like to confirm that all members and persons participated on the agenda are present and can hear me. So um, I guess we'll go around and do introductions now because this is an easy way to do it. So um, I guess I'll go first and uh, everybody can just tag a person to go after them. Um, so I'm Nerissa Wallen, clearly chair of the school committee. Um, Ryan, do you want to go next? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Brian Forget, Superintendent of Schools. <laughs> Who are you tagging? Oh, uh, we'll go to Kyle, the only other administration. I should say, um, David wasn't able to be here. We knew that Kim is under the weather and we're knocking on wood, um, that it's just a cold. So Kim isn't able to be here, but I'll tag Kyle. Kyle Warren, School Business Administrator. <laughs> Thanks, Kyle. Who are you tagging? Uh, let's go with Maureen. <laughs> right, well, thank you. <laughs> uh, Maureen Heffernan, School Committee. And I will tag, let's see, Linda. Uh, Linda Lukowski, um, School Committee member, Ronna Lee. Ronna Lee Ray Parrott, uh, Board of Selectmen from Salisbury, and I'll stick in Salisbury and go with Neil. Neil Harrington, town manager in Salisbury, and I will tag Caitlin. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Caitlin Hunter, school committee, and I will go with Erin, even though we can't see her. So I'll turn my video on for a second. Sorry, I'm eating dinner. Um, I'm Erin Berger. I'm also Salisbury school committee, and I am going to tag um, Larry. Larry's the next one I see. Larry, you're on Larry. Thing. There you go. There we go. I'm used to being muted all the time. <laughs> Larry White, I'm chairman of the finance, Rally Finance Committee. I'll tag Peter Sincillo. Hi, my name's Peter Sensola from the Finance Committee in Raleigh, and uh, uh, who's left? Uh, I'm left. Claire is left. Claire, okay. I'm, my name's okay. not really Claire, it's Cliff, but uh, I'm from the Raleigh Board of Selectmen. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I recognize you now. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brian can fix that. Hang on. Can you fix that? Yeah, yeah there you go. Cliff. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's a pretty... Jesus, what can't you do? <laughs> Cliff, the powers are endless. Unbelievable. I, I'm not answering anything else. <laughs> I'm, tr I'm trying to think of who I s is. Was Erica? I see Erica and Paul Lees. Yeah. The only two and, Jeff. And, and, Alicia. and Alicia, I think. And Joe's connecting right now. So who wants to go next? I don't even know who you named first, Brian. I'll take sure. Erica. I'm Erica Coles Jacobson. I'm Newberry Finance Committee. Who are you tagging? And I'll tag Jeff Walker. Jeff Walker, Newberry Selectman, and I'll tag Alicia. Alicia Greco, Vice Chair, Newberry Select Board, and I'll tag, I think I heard Paul Lees. Paul Lees, uh, Triton School Committee, Rowley. Uh, Maybe. And tag Joe, but he seems to have stepped away. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> Who else is up? Joe came and he went. I was it. Set, set oh, my. Me. Yeah. Okay. There he is. Oh. No. Mm. Hi, Joe. Hello. How's it going? Pretty good. Pretty good. good. I almost forgot. Sorry about that. Nope. All good. You made it in plenty of time. So. All right. I think that covers everybody then. Um, hang on, let me go back to the rest of my script. 
For this meeting, the Triton School Committee is convening remotely via Zoom using the information posted on the district's website identifying how the public may join. If you are personally attending by video conference using your device's camera, please be aware that others may be able to see you. Committee members and administrators, please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. All supporting materials that have been provided to members of this body are available on the district's website with the agenda posting unless otherwise noted. So there are updated materials that Brian sent out um, was it this afternoon. It's all kind of blended together today. I think it was this afternoon. Um, so those are the most updated materials that, um, that we'll have for tonight. The public is encouraged to follow along using the posted agenda. Each vote taken at this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that anything that you broadcast will be captured by the recording. All right, so welcome back. It feels like it's been a really long time, <laughs> a really, really long time since we last met. Um, so we'll try not to take too much of your time tonight for, um, for the pleasantries, because I think we want to get into discussion and there's obviously a lot to update on here. Um, so if we can, I'm just gonna ask you to look through the meeting notes from the November 5th, 2020 DCC meeting and see if you have any corrections that need to be made to those. We don't need a vote since they're not official minutes, um, but obviously we'd like to keep an accurate record here. I read them, Nerissa, and I don't see any changes. Okay, thanks, Alicia. Anybody have anything? No, not seeing anything, all right. So we are going to move straight on to the school year update with the learning model then. And I'm going to pass the torch to Brian. Yes. Um, so briefly, I think we've talked about this and I know some of you have watched school committee meetings and I've had conversations with some of you. Um, so we are in hybrid as of Tuesday. So we return to our full hybrid model uh, as of this past Tuesday, which was the something of January, the 26th of January. Um, and so at this point, you know, we're um, hoping we are able to remain in the hybrid model. Our numbers across the communities, across the state, within the schools um, have trended down, not precipitously, uh, but the discussion around uh, remaining in the remote model after the holidays was based on the, uh, the assumed and what did turn out to be a surge, um, certainly across the state and our communities. And, and we saw that in our schools as well. So, um, so we are on a good trend. Um, so this is um, the same model where we shifted uh, on October 27th, I believe we shifted into the hybrid model and then uh, slipped back to full remote uh, in early December. Um, so our, just a quick summary. So all students are in two days per week. Monday is a fully remote day. Um, students are engaging largely synchronously with their teachers. Um, and then cohort A is in on Tuesdays and Thursdays in the building. Cohort B is in the building Wednesdays and Fridays. Um, and then we have our high priority learners, um, students who, whether through a, a needs documented on IEP or a 504 or not documented on anything, um, have specific learning needs that uh, preclude them from learning effectively remotely. Uh, and those students are in roughly 300 students, 325 students that are in all days, um, every day of the week. So, um, so that is the, the model that we had put into place um, back in October, as I said. Um, we do have roughly 280 uh, students participating in a remote academy. Um, so again, that's the same um, setup that we had back in the fall uh, in that uh, those students have remained in that remote academy. So those students that, um, what, even when we were in hybrid, we're in the remote academy. When we shifted back to full remote, they still remained with their remote academy plan. Um, and so there's been no change for those students. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. I mean, I feel like I don't want to keep rehashing this. Um, I know you've all been <laughs> keenly aware and involved in discussions uh, to varying degrees uh, based on your involvement with the district. Um, so, I mean, certainly, I think probably easier to just uh, kind of pause and see if there are any questions about where we are or where we're going. Don't see any, so I think you can move on, Brian, and maybe they'll come up as we're talking about um, kind of what the future holds. With the budget, you mean? Mm -hmm. Not like globally, we're not just like talking about the future in general. 
Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> I'd prefer if we could just stick to the budget. I'd really appreciate I'm, that. I was going to say, I've been wishing for my crystal ball since last March. Yeah. <laughs> so I would know what the future holds and it still hasn't shown up. So yeah. the only thing, thing Amazon hasn't managed to deliver to my house. <laughs> yeah, exactly. All right. So let's shift to the budget. So, um, we are, I, I literally was, I, as we were talking last night and presenting, it was obviously a much more detailed discussion. We spent three hours with the committee last night talking through details. Um, afterwards, thinking about it, I, I literally couldn't believe the time that has lapsed since we last sat around the table with the DCC and talked about the fiscal 21 budget. I believe those discussions were in April and May ahead of the June meeting. But um, uh, our goal, and Kyle's certainly going to take some uh, a lot of time here to, or a lot of the the uh, air time to to go through some details. But our goal is to is to give you a very brief summary of this document. Um, again, went over it in great detail last night. Um, there, there's nothing really in here that, uh, as far as the fixed costs that we don't talk about year over year. So our goal is to give you the Reader's Digest version, help you. Uh, Make sure you understand where our, our cost drivers are um, and then have an opportunity to discuss that. So um, if there's anything you want more detail on or we're not telling you enough, please just interject. Don't even raise your hand. Just scream out um, and we'll pause and, and, and give you more detail. So um, the, the document is um, set up uh, very differently than in recent years, as is the process. Um, you are all part several of the, I don't know if it was everyone, but several of the, uh, those of you here tonight were part of a discussion last April and May, um, following the, the finalization of the fiscal 21 budget, the current budget, uh, we finalized that. The committee uh, took a final vote on March 11th, and then everything happened. The world came crashing down two days later on Friday, March 13th. So um, obviously that put a wrench in everything. As we went through the spring, um, we came back to the table with the DCC, and, and the basic question was, Times are very different in the two months that had passed since uh, we had closed and town halls had closed and everything was closed. Um, that was a new reality that the towns were facing as well. Um, at that point in time, the discussion around the DCC table was we're willing to commit. We committed to the fiscal 21 budget as it was presented and approved by the committee. Um, and we're gonna stand by that commitment. Um, that was incredibly appreciated. Uh, that, that budget last year or the current year budget um, did do some restoring of prior year um, cuts, um, made some small changes with big impact, like taking away the parking fee at the high school. Not a huge deal for those sitting at the, you know, around the screen, but a really <clears throat> big deal for high school students and families. Um, so there were some, some key investments in that budget, and we are incredibly appreciative of the fact that the towns uh, remained committed to that. Um, at that table, or at that same discussion, I believe it was Cliff who said, however, we fully anticipate that next year is going to be really challenging. So um, we remember those words. We remember that conversation that ensued from that um, and have moved forward with proposing a budget uh, that really focuses on level services. And then we identif identified some needs um, that we collectively believe are important for the district. So there were no uh, individual principal presentations with school councils. There was no presentation from the athletic director, the director of technology, or um, any of the other various departments in regards to um, the needs that we have. Um, we're very cautious in the fact that um, that's not to say that those aren't needs. Um, we, we have spent hours and hours over the years uh, fighting about what we believe is the lack of funding uh, across the state for education. That still exists. We still believe in uh, our towns and schools are woefully uh, underfunded by the state in regards to the way the formula works. Um, but, and we will get back to that <laughs> fight. Um, but in the interim, I, I think it's important that we uh, recognize the fact that we all as individuals and as uh, individuals personally or taxpayers or our cities and towns uh, are, in dealing, are dealing with uh, very challenging financial times. Um, and so we have to make sure that we have a process that, uh, that recognizes that. So um, it is a fine balance because there are those who will say, but you're not fighting for my need. Um, so I want to make sure that we just pause and say that's we're not not fighting for needs. There are certainly needs. Um, but I think the, the challenging year uh, is the most important context. So streamline the process, which means we streamlined the document. So you have one document. 
Um, the, the, the basic structure is set the, t set the context, a lot of what I've just said. Um, then we go into our fixed costs, the things that uh, are gonna automatically increase year over year, same topics we talk about each year. Um, and then uh, look at uh, five areas where we, are, we believe we need to make some strategic investments um, as we look to next year. Some of those are continuations of previous commitments. Some of those are new challenges born uh, by the pandemic. Um, and so I'll go through those uh, and then we can talk about the overall uh, impact on what the bottom line would be. So uh, part of the story that needs to be told is um, in extraordinary times come extraordinary uh, funding sources. And so certainly um, as, you, as the towns know, um, you received CARES funding um, we received CARES, ESSER, we've received a second round of ESSER. Um, so I'm just gonna pause and have Kyle just give us, a, it's actually on page three of the document, just a quick little snapshot of the four big pots of funds that we've received to date uh, and where those are being used. Kyle. Absolutely. Uh, so like Brian said, bottom of page three, there's a chart that details out the, the four most significant federal awards. Uh, all of these are federal in nature. Uh, the first one being the Remote Learning Technology Essentials Funding, also called RLTE, commonly abbreviated. Uh, that was a, a competitive application process. Uh, we submitted our total needs and we were thrilled to receive the 105,000. Uh, that made the one-to-one -one initiative possible where all students in the district now have a personal Chromebook device. Uh, we through that $105,000 of funding, uh, we purchased uh, about 900 Chromebooks and leased them over three years. Uh, so that 105,000 covers the, the first, year, first lease payment uh, for this year, FY21. Uh, the next one, CARES Act, ESSER. Uh, everybody's, well, it's commonly used term again, ESSER, uh, Elementary Secondary Schools Emergency Relief. That, is the uh, pot of funds that we received in March when the pandemic first started at the, or immediately after the, the closure of schools. Uh, that has a useful life through September 30th of 2021, 20, uh, I'm sorry, uh, FY22. So we're actually electing to uh, push that off till FY22. We're going to use half of it for out of district tuitions for special ed students uh, because of our anticipated uh, uh, needs, uh, certainly some learning loss there. So there may be additional students uh, who have to go out of district. And then the second half will be used for the second lease payment on that one to one initiative. Uh, Larry, I can take your question now. Easier just to take them as they go. We are. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Yep. Uh, okay. Going back to the remote learning technology essential funding, that was for the, the one uh, one year lease for this year, but not fiscal year twenty two. Is that correct? Correct. Yep. So the uh, the RLTE grant that hundred and five thousand that's for the first lease payment. The CARES Act, the ESSER funding, that $215,000 allotment, that's the second lease payment in FY22. So the $105,000 is kind of uh, FYI, has nothing to do with the 22 budget, and it's not reflected anywhere in the 22 budget. Uh, correct. That's correct. Yep. Okay. And then the second lease payment that's in the ESSER. Uh, <clears throat> half of that is for fiscal year 22. Uh, is that shown anywhere in the budget or is that just a wash for the Chromebook leases which aren't in the budget to begin with? Uh, that's correct. It's not shown in the FY22 budget because that grant uh, will uh, be ut fully utilized to fully cover that second year's lease payment. Okay, thank you. Yep, absolutely. Thanks for the questions. 
Uh, then the, let's see, CARES Act, we went at the 215,000, went over that. Uh, CVRF is next, COVID relief funding. That's the 502,000. Uh, it has a useful life through the end of FY21, June 30th, 21. Uh, we have already fully utilized that entire pool of funding, uh, 160,000 for remote technology, things like uh, cameras for so teachers can um, stream and uh, teach remotely. Uh, other things for instruct remote instruction, uh, various um, online subscriptions, and then 125,000 for special education services and the balance of 217,000 towards outfitting our schools to make sure that they were a safe learning environment uh, given what we know about the pandemic. Things like the, the study uh, to look at the air exchange rates and the uh, PPE, other things like that. And then finally, the last one, CARES Act round two, ESSER round two. So that's hot off the presses. Uh, we found out yesterday that we we're going to be receiving 850,000, uh, still determining what our use for that will be as we're unpacking the, the guidance on it and the allowable uses. Uh, I'm sure we'll get into that in a little more detail, uh, but we do know that that has an allowable use period through September 30th of 22, so FY23. All right. Thank you, Kyle. So any other Back to Larry. So uh, all of these grants basically are for this year. Uh, what do you expect uh, as far as fiscal 22 uh, grants? And are those going to be offsetting budget items? Or is it in addition, is it, is it a wash type of grant? So we have to be careful with the, the funding too. We need to make sure to use it for one-time costs uh, so that we don't create funding cliffs. Uh, so that's why, uh, for example, on the, the COVID relief funding, the CVRF, where we're using for like a one-time study or the, the CARES Act ESSER funding, uh, where we're using it for the lease payment on the one-to-one -one initiative. Uh, so right now, the funding that rolls into FY22 are the the first pool of CARES Act, uh, the 215,000, that can be used in FY22, as well as the second round, the 850,000. Uh, it says 800 there, but we just found out the revised amount yesterday. And that can actually go through fiscal, into the start of fiscal 23. So if there were, so it's through September of 2022. So we have a full year and a half, is that a year and nine months to use that funds? Those funds. How much of that 850,000 do you expect to be available in 22? Um, so we're, we're still determining what we would need to use that for uh, based on our current year budget and our, our standing, uh, as well as just still uh, where it is so hot off the presses to see what the allowable uses are. So we, I, I don't have a good answer for that right now. Yeah. I don't know, Brian. I was going to say, we, so we've been waiting to have this confirmed. And so part of the um, question has been, we knew this, so this was uh, the second phase of the CARES Act that was approved back in December. And we've been waiting patiently to know what our allotment is. Um, we have had vendors contacting us and saying, hey, we know you got this much money. Um, let us help you spend it. And we kept saying, hmm, we don't know we have that yet. So it was released yesterday along with the state budget with some complicating factors about minimum local contributions and such that we're trying to unpack. But um, what we're anticipating now, so in, in the narrative that I tried to explain, we tried to explain was there's still a lot of unknowns. Um, so what the, the kind of the big pots that we're looking at right now is we know there will be a significant deficit in our food services uh, program. Um, we know that and we're okay with that because it's providing a very necessary service for all of our students and quite honestly, uh, families who don't even have kids in the schools, anyone up through the age of 18 is eligible. So there is a, there will be a deficit in that program. Um, so offsetting that, um, actually, as you were uh, all coming in, we were talking about um, pooled um, surveillance testing. That's a new program. They would be beyond a partnership early on with the Department of Ed. 
we would absolutely have some incurred costs where we to continue that um, beyond um, early April. Um, so that could easily be hundreds of thousands, depending on um, the, the program and how that plays out. And then later on, we'll talk about roughly is 242,000 um, that as part of a discussion last night, um, we determined already knowing that these were costs that we need to spend. And so that's, that was the change from what was proposed last night um, to what is uh, that calculation that's uh, here for you tonight. So I feel like there's one more pot, one more big, um, chunk. So you figure if that takes off 246. So I mean, easily could be 50, 60, 70% spent in the current year and what we've already uh, earmarked it for. Um, but there are still uh, many, many unknowns. One of the things I didn't say is we're basing our budget on um, using the fiscal 21 assumptions that we made a, a year ago, March staffing levels, student enrollment levels. We're using that as our basis because we know we lost 160 some odd students um, in our foundation enrollment. We anticipate through conversations that many of those students will return. There are many families who chose to, to homeschool um, and they're routinely <laughs> calling us saying, my gosh, we can't wait to send them back. Um, there are families who chose private schools and not because they uh, believe in private schools, but they're willing to take on the tuition because they wanted to make sure that their, their child was in school every day. Um, and so we anticipate the majority of those students will come back. So we're anticipating that those, those um, staffing levels and those students. So, so that's the assumption we made. And we're assuming that we are back in the fall for full in-person learning. There will be masks. There will be sanitizer. We're still talking about HVAC. We're still talking about um, safety precautions in place, but we're modeling this budget, assuming we're back in person. So there will again, our, if we're all back in person, do we still need a small remote learning academy for those families that choose it? Or are there other um, uh, things, other uh, protections in uh, things that we'll have to put in place based on the assumption that we make if other things continue to change. The one thing we keep talking about is the only thing we can count on uh, in these times is the fact that it is perpetual uh, uncertainty as things are, are continually changing. So we could fully commit this and I will say, so more later, but one of the, there's some language in the chapter in the in house one that allows towns to use this ESSER two, this final 800 and 850 some odd thousand dollars to use that to reduce any increase in your minimum local contributions. None of your minimum local contributions increased, your assessments increased, but your minimum local contributions didn't increase. So this has been a very hot topic <laughs> around um, the state and trying to figure out exactly what this means because this literally blindsided everyone. Um, I, it's fiscally responsible. Uh, I would say it is not because you would be using one-time funds to falsely deflate and it would have to kick that up later even if, if it was possible. So all that to say, this, this pot of funds, we want to hold on to as much as we possibly can um, because this is gonna be the piece of funding that allows us to react without having to make cuts and knowing we can't come back to the towns after we finalize a budget um, to solve problems. This is, this is our safety net right here. Um, again, we've, we've probably committed somewhere in the vicinity of, of 500-ish plus, maybe even closer to six, um, if you look at um, all the things that I had mentioned. Um, so that's, I think that's a long-winded answer to, I don't know where Larry went, oh, there you are, um, to your question, Larry. Thank you. Certainly. So any other questions about the grants? Okay. I have a question, oh. but it's not about the grants. As far as when you supposedly going to have full day kindergarten, that's going to be a big expense. That's, that's, isn't that going to be an expense that's going to be borne by the, you know, the towns? Because how much is that is going to be him tuition, you know, was most of it? Uh, so I'll get to that. That's one of the, the new spending that we um, talked about as far as a strategic spend. 
So the current year's budget funded 75,000 towards the first of three years. We needed to add 75,000 each year for three years because we collect roughly 225,000 in tuition. So for this year, before pandemic, um, the 75,000 paid down um, the tuition from close to 3,000, 29.50 to 2,000. Mm -hmm. An additional 75,000 added next year brings the tuition from 2,000 to 1,000. And if we could add another 75,000 in fiscal 23, uh, it brings as of September, 2022, we have universal free full day kindergarten. Free. Okay. Yep. So that's the, that's the plan at this point. That was where we set out last year. Um, whether or not that 75,000 is a priority that, that we can carry in the budget um, is remains to be seen over the coming weeks as uh, details begin to, or continue to solidify. Hmm. Linda. Oh, okay. Yes, Brian, could you explain when you were talking about the food services that the deficit, it might be helpful for them to understand what that deficit is? Sure. Kyle, do you want to speak about that? Kyle's yeah, absolutely. Detail. So right now, so this year, just a quick little background that uh, normally our food service receipts would be a blend of uh, students who are paying for their lunch or and then as well as state and federal receipts for students who are uh, qualify for free or reduced lunch. Uh, fast forward to this year, the federal government extended a waiver where all students now qualify for free lunch, regardless of income guidelines. So we've done away with all those in-person receipts and now it's uh, exclusively state and federal funding. Because we're paying our staff still to create these meals, but there's, it's, uh, we've been oscillating our learning models, uh, whether it's hybrid or uh, remote. Uh, certainly there aren't on any time, there isn't uh, all students in the building. So we're seeing that decrease in revenue. And it's not a, a linear relationship between uh, the number of meals sold and the cost of that program. So while we're in a hybrid learning model, uh, we've been losing about 10,000 a month and then while we're in a full remote, been losing actually about 30,000 a month. Uh, but the way that we can minimize that deficit is through increased participation uh, in that program, uh, where just trying to get as many students to partake in the free lunches as possible, whether they're sh uh, showing up to school or we've been uh, delivering meals to, uh, through NRT bus uh, directly to the homes of these students. Uh, so that we've made some headway, certainly in marketing the program, getting the word out there, uh, but that deficit, so the 200,000 is what we're projecting as a, a worst case scenario, uh, probably projecting it to be closer to 150,000. And uh, last point just wanted to make is we looked at, can we cut some costs there? And with our staffing levels, it's, we need a certain level of staffing to create, prepare these meals. And if we were to cut that staffing, it would limit our, our output essentially. So it would have a detrimental impact on how many meals we could serve. Uh, so that's kind of where we, we stand with that. Does that highlight the, the situation? I was gonna why, say, is, but... why is school more expensive than, than uh, you know, hybrid? It's, it's more of a, not more expensive, it's a loss of revenue. It's probably the better way to look at it because we have less, less students in the building. We're serving less meals, whereas our costs are somewhat fixed. Certainly there's a variable component to it, the amount of food that we're, and raw goods that we're purchasing, but uh, there's not a, a lot of fluctuation there. It's a lot of personnel costs. Uh, so it's, it's more of a revenue loss than anything. So the hybrid ones go in and they, and they pay money towards the, whereas it's remote, they don't, they don't pay anything. Is that what you basically were waiting? Uh, so they don't actually pay anything. It's just that we're serving more meals because more students are in in the school buildings participating or oh, okay. uh, receiving lunches. Whereas when we're in remote, it's almost exclusively delivering meals to the homes of families. Okay. So the one hundred and fifty thousand to two hundred thousand that you're talking about is the loss for FY twenty one this year. And then if you go to 
the full schedule in September, then uh -huh. what do you expect as far as the meals? Does that go back to what is normal? Or do you expect to have uh, losses there as well? I'd expect it to go relatively back to normal. Uh, I think that the waiver, it depends on if that waiver extent is extended federally where all students qualify for free lunch. So it's, it's um, but we do get a, I think it's a $4 reimbursement per lunch served and a $2 reimbursement per breakfast served. Uh, so it, it just entirely depends on uh, participation, but I, I would expect that it would go back to normal or relatively anyway. I was gonna say, there's, there's a big push to, uh, to keep this universal free lunch in place. Um, so right now it goes through the end of June. And I know, I mean, at the state level, at the federal level, people are pushing to keep this in place because, you know, it's, I think it's always sometimes hard to determine, you know, who needs food assistance and who doesn't, um, just based on the piece of paper that um, would currently call, or previously, I should say, um, have qualified someone for free lunch. So um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that's a big piece in it. We don't know. I did want to highlight too, we've built up our, I'll call it our infrastructure in that program recently. Our food service director, Lucinda Ward, has applied for numerous grants uh, related to uh, offering these meals. And from the outside organizations, they typically like to invest in the long-term viability of the program. So uh, offering grants to purchase freezers and upgrade equipment think, rather than offset operating losses. Uh, but we've received... Uh, $30,000 grant from our neighbor's table, was it? Uh, as well as another $5,000 grant from another organization. So that certainly helped us, helped our operations to output more meals and create more revenue. So I have a question. Is that deficit, and I think you may have answered this already, but I wanna just go back, circle back, that call it $200,000 deficit, is that um, money gonna come from this ESSER two, $800,000 to fill that deficit? That's what we're anticipating. Okay, thank you. It could, I mean, there's right, I mean, at this point, halfway through the year, there's a long time to go until uh, June 30th. So there could be other areas. Um, at one point we were anticipating, Kyle was, was placeholding $125,000 deficit for charter and choice because we weren't quite sure. We assumed <coughs> that, that part of the, the outflow of students um, was going to potentially go through, have a charter and choice hit that didn't come to fruition. We actually saved money on charter and choice went up just a little bit. Um, so, so there are areas where we would see savings in other areas. Um, you know, we talked about after the budget finalized, we were, we were planning for the world ending. Remember, we were talking about a million dollar loss in chapter 70 or a million and a half. So we had identified cuts. Um, Kyle will talk about the fact that, you know, we had trimmed uh, three teachers this year, just based on attrition, not not making class sizes larger. Two of the three of those um, will still be a savings for next year, but those are savings in the current budget that will help offset some of that um, those savings in other areas. So there was there's so much different spending <laughs> this year. Um, costs for remote academies that we didn't anticipate. Costs for HVAC. Um, so there are areas where we saved. Um, and there are areas where we went, spent significantly more than we anticipated. So, um, but I think, you know, until that all uh, pans out, you know, as we look at that, that Kyle's confidence, I think, grows by the day in regards to how the year will end. But that pot, that SR2, that 850, we're pretty confident um, that that's going to be the last really big um, COVID relief for schools, that, that may not be the case. Um, there is talk about additional aid you know, in, in various pots, but there's been more discussion about um, will, will this next round of, of stimulus funding favor cities and towns that haven't received these bigger pots of funds uh, outside the General Cares Act. So that may not be the case. It may be the case, we don't know, um, but we, we wanna kind of treat this as the probably last big dole out that we have an opportunity to invest really wisely over the next 18 months so that we can mitigate any of these 
knowns that they're not going to stop tomorrow, right? We're just going to continue to have new, new needs and challenges. One quick follow up on that too, as part, uh, if I may, as part of the monthly finance subcommittee meetings that we hold, uh, we've been maintaining a document and it's included in the agenda attachments each month. It details those big ticket items where like Brian mentioned the unfilled positions, some areas of savings that are offsetting those overages that we have like the school lunch, uh, school lunch deficit, the HVAC repairs, things of that nature. So we can, that way we can have a organized mechanism of tracking these big ticket items. Very good, thank you. Yeah. All right, so we'll keep moving. Um, so as far as the structure, again, this, this meeting last night condensed the normal presentations of all the administrators and principals into one evening. And it then condensed in also with the uh, school committee budget workshop where we would be kind of prioritizing. Um, we certainly streamlined the overall request as far as new spending. Um, so the, uh, for those that are interested, and I know all of you have been involved in for years, but the, um, on the website, if you look under the fiscal 21 budget, um, we'll get this fiscal 22 stuff on the, on the website uh, in short order. But on the fiscal 21 section, um, you can go back in and look at the detail line by line items that, that build out the uh, supplies and materials lines at Newbury Elementary School, or what are all the, the different components that add up in the hundred and some odd thousand for technology contracted services. Um, so that line item detail was not reproduced for this year's budget in an effort to streamline, um, but all of that detail that was produced for fiscal 21 is still relevant. There'd be some costs that ebb and flow if we had a two-year you know, uh, subscription for antivirus, and now we don't pay it this year, but we pay a different subscription for something else. Um, so there are some slight changes, but uh, by and large, that, that all that detail that's in with the fiscal 21 and years prior. Uh, is still relevant today. So um, I think it probably makes sense to have Kyle, again, we won't spend a lot of time on it because this is these are details that you're you're used to seeing, uh, but have them go through um, the you know roughly 1.3 million um, that it's going to cost to take us to do business next year with the same level of services that we have this year. So yeah, I can uh, explain those. So starting on page six, we have two and a half pages of the uh, proposed increases as part of our, our level service, the items that fall into the level service uh, broken down into four different categories. So starting at the top of page six, uh, the first one is steps for all unions. We have five collecting collective bargaining agreements uh, or uh, groups for at Triton, the teachers, IAs, T TRTA, unit A and B, cafeteria workers, custodians, and head custodians. So that increase represents the movement down the salary schedule uh, based on the years they've been with the districts. The district uh, one through 11 is, and then you top out at 11 years. Uh, so that's 315,000. Next is the cost of living adjustment or COLA for all unions, those five uh, organizations, 464,705. Uh, worth highlighting that the TRTA unit A and B, so the classroom teachers and the instructional assistants, they have set union agreements for FY21 through uh, for three years. And uh, the remaining three are still in open negotiation. So within that figure, we included an estimate. Uh, next is the cost of living adjustment for all non-union personnel. So that includes our central office staff, administrators, uh, IT, things of that, uh, positions of that nature, 73,506. And by comparison, uh, it was shown, because it was shown on the face of last year's budget document, uh, last year, the sum of those three items was 880,000 uh, of an increase. This year, it's 855,000. Next, we have projected column movement. So looking back to that chart on the uh, salary schedules of the union agreements, that's the left to right movement based on the number of credits beyond <clears throat> and degrees that uh, these individuals have satisfied. So a master's degree to a master's 15 
Um, we typically, last year, we only had 10 individuals indicate that they anticipated moving to a new column. Uh, those notifications are due by December 15th so that we can budget uh, appropriately. So last year, 10 people equaled about a $38,000 increase. This year, we had 35 people submit notification uh, that they anticipate column movement. So that's why you see the increase over the prior year in landing at us uh, 108,925. Next up, the salary reserve. Uh, so looking to maintain a $140,000 balance there as a contingency line item. When you look at that balance as a percentage of our total payroll, which is approximately 26 million, it's 0.5%. Uh, and that gives us uh, flexibility where typically with new hires, we budget for a, a master's degree with six years of experience. Sometimes it comes under than that, maybe somebody with bachelor's three years or, but sometimes it also does uh, uh, come over that. Other scenarios we actually experienced this year where with all, and we'll get into it a little more detail where with so much added technology in the classroom and now a, a new learning model, uh, students using these additional Chromebooks for the one-to-one -one program. Uh, we, our IT department has a ticketing system where if you have a challenge, an issue, whether it be parents, students, or staff members, uh, the PC technicians uh, field those tickets. Uh, we had had two full-time positions there before, and it just wasn't the resources available weren't enough. So we had to uh, utilize that salary reserve in the current year to add another position. Uh, so things like that. And then the last item in the salary uh, bucket up top is actually some staffing reductions. And I just want to dive into that a little bit more that not so much a reduction, it's an un been an unfilled position uh, this year in FY21. There was a grade six teacher at Pine Grove School and a grade, grade two teacher at Salisbury Elementary School where because of retirements, we didn't fill that uh, role. And because of student enrollment, there wasn't a need to refill that position. Uh, looking at our projected enrollment for next year, we still don't anticipate needing to fill those unfilled positions. Uh, so the 167,000, is about 83 per position. And that's a, at a master's six uh, on the salary scale assumption. So 65,000 plus an 18,000 benefit package is what we assume for each of those. So that's where we arrive at the uh, $167,000 worth of savings. I was just gonna note, so there was, there was a third position this year that we didn't fill and that was a sixth grade teacher at Newbury. Um, so there are at this year, there are two grade levels that have only two sections. One of them is sixth grade, which means that that cohort moves on. And then there will only be one grade level with two sections, which means we need to put that teacher back uh, to keep the same class sizes. So the, the savings this year will still carry, that's, I think I mentioned that earlier, will carry two of those three positions as savings into next year's budget. Thank you jump into the next section, uh, benefit line items. Uh, so right at the top there, medical dental insurance, talking with Maya uh, there statewide, noting that changes could be in a range of either a 0.6% decrease in premiums or upwards of a 6.8% increase in premiums with a statewide average of about 2.9%. Talking with our reps, they felt comfortable with a 2% increase in our premiums. They felt like that was a conservative uh, estimate. And I apologize for the error there uh, in the, to the right of that $104,000 increase. It says a 5% increase. It, it was, that increase is reflective of a 2% increase. And there's talks of potentially a premium holiday for next year as well, but that's not set in stone. They're still, uh, we're still waiting information on that. Liability and workers' compensation insurance, a $21,000 increase. Uh, workers' comp, we talking with our uh, representative at Fred C. Fred C. Church, 
they anticipate about a, a 2% increase in premiums, which they were pretty thrilled with that. I guess statewide or uh, nationwide, those insurance premiums have been upwards of 10 to 15% increases, but based on our, our claims experience, uh, looking at a, about a 2% increase. And then our, our general liability insurance policy and student accident insurance policy, uh, looking at about a eight to 10% increase in premiums. So that's yielding the $21,000 increase there. How much was the dollar amount for you, the uh, 50% holiday premium? So this year, we, like you highlight, we had a 50% premium holiday in July and that yielded a $200,000 savings uh, based on current enrollment levels. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Good question. Uh, the next one on page seven, right at the top, unemployment insurance uh, based on Mark nationwide trends. Uh, we've been seeing an increase in claims, certainly an increase in fraudulent claims, uh, but we're not paying those. Uh, but based on the increase in allowable reasons why an individual could collect unemployment, uh, we're proposing a $10,000 increase in that appropriation line item to align with actual costs uh, that we've been incurring. And then retirement and taxes, the $137,000 there, that's exclusively related to our Essex Regional Retirement uh, Assessment. Uh, that is for our non-teaching staff. That's, I'm sure all the communities have been experiencing similar increases uh, due to market trends and uh, reductions in interest rates, uh, as well as, uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. The unemployment insurance uh, last night, you said that there were approximately 120 fraudulent claims. Over what time period uh, was that? And has there been an increase or decrease in the number of claims? They go in waves. Very interesting. So at the onset of the pandemic, I would say in the, the June time frame, we certainly saw it, the bulk of those fraudulent claims come through. Then there was a lull. And then in October, November, all of a sudden the uptick started again. Uh, and a, another wave of them came through and looking at our, uh, the listservs that I'm a member of statewide, other districts, cities and towns were experiencing a similar patterns as well. And every single employee who was impacted this by this was notified. And then also uh, we notified the state of the fraudulent claim as well so that we won't they're still hanging out uh, because there's, it's such a perverse issue uh, that there's delays in having those taken off our, our bills, but it's well document that, documented that those are fraudulent claims. Right, but the 120 then applies to FY21. There were, so that's been accumulated from uh, starting in FY20 to date. Okay. I believe we've only had one so far, one or two in uh, this month. And, and we're a pay as you go as far as our unemployment costs. So we don't fully insure where you pay a premium that your this year's claims hit a set cost next year. So it's dependent on our actual claims rather than being fully insured. So claims this year impact this year. So this is a big problem at the state level. Um, I sat in on a fiscal policy committee meeting at the MMA, and um, I believe it was the mayor of the city of Marlboro was very um, upset about these claims. And um, I know that I think the town of Newbury itself had 25 claims going. So just in our little town. So this is this is a bigger huger, you know, issue at the state level, and they are well aware, aware of it. And um, I don't know. I don't know how it's going to go away, but as long as you document, I think you're going to be all right. Yeah, it's, federal, it's taking. So. Yeah. yeah uh, to your point too about how they're being inundated with it, we have fraudulent claims that have been sitting around since uh, June, I would say May still, yeah. where they haven't been taken off our monthly bill. 
they took off yeah. half for some reason, <laughs> but then not the remaining portion. Uh, just yeah, and it, it impacts m m municipalities because we don't have a revenue other, other otherwise revenue source. You know what I mean? It's very, it's it's very. Uh, you could end up having budget cuts because of it, and it's it's just it's a big it's a big deal, and Certainly. they're looking at it at the at the state level. Yeah, yeah, we have uh, we've had thirty thousand dollars historically appropriated with for that line item, very minimal amount of claims, uh, the increase of the 10,000 would bring it to 40,000. We've generally kept that, the, the spend has been in that in that uh, ballpark. And then mm -hmm. anytime you remember years where we're cutting significantly, we commensurately increase that line because anytime we're making personnel cuts, the, the unemployment costs go up. But I was unemployed for a while there. Not really. <laughs> Ready to move on, Kyle? I am, yep. Uh, next one is special ed out of district tuitions. So this is a, it comes up every year, very challenging to predict. Our special ed department has a detailed roster of all the students currently in outside placements. Uh, we also track the students who we anticipate may move to an outside placement. Uh, as you're aware, if a, a, a new student needing of an outside placement moves into the district, that can cause a significant $100,000 fluctuation in this line item. Uh, but as part of this process, we're trying to exhibit the, the high watermark of where we anticipate uh, our costs could be. Uh, so we're proposing a, it's actually a just north of a $300,000 increase for this year, but as I mentioned earlier on, that uh, first round of ESSER money that we've allocated to offset this increase for FY22 uh, in the tune of 103,000. So that brings that down to 206,000. And just keeping an eye on that based on the trends, uh, I won't elaborate too much more just because I think we're used to hearing about it each year, but certainly being very watchful uh, of that particular line item. Uh, jumping to general transportation, we contract with NRT bus uh, to provide all of our yellow school bus uh, transportation services. That $46,000 increase is relative to the new contract uh, that we signed with them, FY21 through FY25. Uh, it represents about a, a two to 3% increase in uh, the various tiered ride bus trainer transportation types that they provide. Uh, included in that figure also is late buses and uh, a little bit uh, of an allowance in case we need to transport students for uh, finals and things of that nature. Uh, worth highlighting that special ed transportation is not included on here uh, because we, our special ed department maintains a roster for all those out of district students and detailing their transportation needs as well. And based on the students who we uh, project to be graduating this year, uh, as well as maybe students who will be needing new out of district placements, projected to be a wash, uh, no net increase there. School choice so, to it. Go ahead. Can we stop there for a second? I have a question on the um, general transportation. Yes. So I remember earlier in the pandemic when everybody stayed at home. I don't know, Brian, was it the end of fiscal, end of the last year, school year, when there was an issue with um, the district contractually obligated to pay for buses that never ran, and that was in violation of statute? So what happened this year? Because the buses, is the contract similar? If this, if you're Budget assumptions are the same as last year. What does that do to this transportation line and has it been adjusted? So that I can take that one. Yeah. So this year we followed that same member memorandum of understanding agreement uh, documented with NRT bus where any buses that were not utilizing were being charged a 78% reduced rate. So a 22% 22 reduction there. Uh, that is carrying this year as well. Uh, we've been using, when students have been in a full remote 
learning model. Certainly we've been using less buses, so paying that 78% rate. Uh, but when we shift then to a hybrid learning model, more students, we're having to run our pretty much our normal bus runs uh, actually for kindergarten ridership because of uh, we've been having to run a, a few more than uh, kindergarten runs than we anticipated. Fast forward to next year with the expectation that we would be able to have potentially a full in-person. We wouldn't want to carry over that 22% reduction. So it, our expectation is that we would be at that full contract level, full ridership. Okay, so this assumption for next year assumes that we're all back in school as normal. Yes. Yep. And if we're not, will you find savings in that line item? Potentially. Okay. Based on, based on the ridership, if we are in hybrid, we're still running all of the buses every day. But if we were in a, a fully remote model, then we're only transporting our high need students, which yeah. are our limited number of runs. Thank you. Absolutely. I think, Great question. I think it's worth noting too, that we have fewer families that want their children on the bus. There are more drop-offs, um, but they have the, the students that are on the bus have to be farther apart um, because of social distancing. Um, we can't put them two to a seat like we normally would. So it sort of balances out you you know you have fewer kids on there but you also can't run buses with the the volume of students on there that used to be on there yeah Thank thanks you. for highlighting that i'll jump into the next two together school choice tuitions and charter school tuitions uh, so looking at the most recent data available uh, school choice we're projecting almost level, uh, a $5,600 increase right now. And that, that's a moving target as well. Um, this year, we're just, I think we just got our figures finalized uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so paying close attention to that, but based on current trends, we feel comfortable with that, that figure. And then charter school tuitions just got the updated information yesterday as part of the governor's budget uh, proposal. And uh, moving forward, we'll be comfortable actually showing a $50,000 reduction in that line item over the current year budget. Uh, so we'll, we'll update our records to show that. General technology, uh, now we're going into the, the various departments. Uh, wanted to highlight that a note on non-salary um, line items, we expect no net increase. There's certainly a, a shifting between certain line items. I think Brian, Brian touched upon it earlier where uh, we have a new contract for copiers, uh, so we have some savings there, but now we have online learning subscriptions, or that just being an example of uh, other costs or um, vendors increasing their rates based on a new contract. So, But we went through, even though we're showing level services, I do want to highlight that we still had the same process where all of our budget, proposed budget line items, we have spreadsheets substantiating all of those costs showing specifically what we're allocating those amounts to. Athletics, same process as uh, general technology, sat down with the uh, athletic director. The $4,600 increase there represents uh, the coaching stipend, stipends where that's a, a component of the TRTA unit A contract or based on their uh, years of uh, service. Uh, they have contractually obligated increases. Uh, there has been some shifting uh, in non-salary items, but maintaining that uh, level budget. Uh, and then also I did want to highlight that with middle school basketball, uh, where the athletic director is proposing discontinuing uh, the middle school basketball program because there is the Triton youth basketball program separate to that, where students still have the opportunity to play competitive basketball. And that would shift uh, to a additional JV2 uh, girls basketball session, section so that uh, there's two boys JV teams and two girls JV teams. Uh, also lastly, with that athletics program, our general fund budget supports half of that program's uh, costs. Half is supported by user fees. Uh, which is uh, accounted for in a revolving fund. 
So in our general fund, we have about 340, 350,000 worth of costs, an additional matching amount in the uh, revolving fund. So a total of about 700,000 worth of costs associated with uh, athletics, half being associated with the general fund. And I'll round out the last two line items. Custodial supplies and cost contracted services. Again, wanted to highlight zero uh, net increase there. In certain schools, there were one-time costs, uh, most notably Pine Grove School with the opening of the new school. Uh, we wanted some, uh, if there were some repairs that were needing to be made or uh, some assessments, projects, uh, one-time purchases, those don't need to be repeated, uh, but certainly in the new normal that we're in, added costs uh, with supplies. Uh, with those budgets haven't matched what our spending levels have been. So any savings have moved over to those supply line items to where now at each school, each elementary school, we have a supply budget for custodians of uh, 25,000 and then a $45,000 supply line item for the middle school, high school campus. And on the topic of operations, the last item there, utilities and services, an $85,000 decrease we're proposing. Uh, that's composed of the uh, heating costs and the electricity costs, notably associated with the Pine Grove School, way more efficient than we were projecting. Uh, so looking at our facilities director, Chris Walsh has his spreadsheets where he looks on the actual usage and therms and the uh, current market rates and he calculates everything to see what, what our costs will be that we anticipate incurring with also the assumption that we have all this added technology in the classroom now, a thousand more Chromebooks. Uh, I think the using technology in the classroom is just gonna continue to elevate. So we, we anticipate using more electricity because of that. Uh, so we, with that still in mind, we felt comfortable trimming back those budgets by a total of 85,000. <clears throat> so we should say in. that, I think we Go should ahead. say that all towns should build a brand new building because they are <laughs> so much more efficient like the town of Raleigh mm -hmm. did. Just gonna put that out there. <laughs> Shocking, yeah, I mean, literally, literally we yeah. trimmed back knowing there would be more conservation and it's, it is unbelievable the level of efficiency these brand new buildings can, can put forth. Good to hear. Yes. Yes. Very good to hear. Very wise investment. Very good on the to hear. Network. Yeah. <laughs> Who's next? The Remember? basic savings that you have are the 167000 for uh, not needing two teachers, but then the 85000 uh, decrease in gas and electric usage. There's no other savings that you could come up with of any significance. Is that correct? That is correct. Understand that there's other costs that are gonna go up and we're finding ways to absorb those in other areas, right? So in all those general supply lines, um, every school has instructional materials, they've got regular kind of office materials. Um, Kyle talked about um, maintenance and facilities, supplies and materials. You know, one of the part of the assumption is we certainly have some COVID related funds left for continued PPE and sanitizer that we're buying by the gallon and the, the increase in those supply lines that we're able to be offset by savings in other areas are is kind of planning for the new norm, right? We're going to be buying masks likely for longer than the COVID funds are there. Certainly sanitizer, that's going to be the new norm, you know, all but take a shower on your way into the building and that stuff. So so that's kind of preparing for the new norm. But yes, those are the big buckets of savings um, that we identified. And then Kyle noted um, this all, right? This is a preliminary look. And so things are subject to change. We'll talk about revenues in a second. Um, the, the medical has a potential to be lower. I don't believe, I mean, they basically said, there's your high water mark. There's a potential savings with medical. We might learn that the, the premium holiday is a definite so that if they let districts know that and we could count on that, that's certainly savings. Um, that would be cliff funding, right? Because that would re reinstate the following year. Uh, but the, the other known right now, since this um, was published on Monday, 
um, was Kyle noted the charter that we're able to take another set, uh, 50,000 in savings off of that charter figure. Um, and that still leaves some buffer there um, as far as those costs. Um, uh, special ed out of district is a number that we're gonna continue to take a look at. Um, we believe that's the high water mark and we hope it's that that could potentially um, shift in the right direction. So there are other areas. Again, we talk about the tentative being the absolute high water mark. Um, there are other areas as we continue through the process that we may um, see some savings um, and hopefully things like regional transportation um, and other areas get better and produce um, better revenues, increased revenues. Erica? Erica? I have a question. Did we realize any savings? There were a number of open positions that were being advertised throughout the fall. Was there any savings in this year's budget that we could have realized, like we realized that are going forward, anything in that way? Just knowing that those, there were a lot of unfilled positions. Yeah, absolutely. So that's part, as part of that document uh, that we review at Finance Subcommittee each month uh, to offset some of those overages we've been experiencing experiencing like the HVAC repairs, uh, we've I detailed out unfilled positions that we know we will not fill for the rest of the year. There are some positions where we're continually trying to, still trying to fill them, uh, instructional assistants, uh, uh, teachers who might be out on leave, uh, things of, uh, roles of that nature. But, so it's, it's mostly been spent in other areas, but remember any, so any savings at the end of the year mm -hmm. roll to E and D, right? That's the right. mechanism. So anything over the revenue, any revenues over what we assumed or any underspending goes to E and D and then all the towns get a certified copy of that, you know, each fall, whenever that happens. Are any of these transfers documented uh, in further detail in the budget or this just all lumped together. What transfer? So I can, you know, if, you're, if you're spending a ton of money on uh, <clears throat> hand sanitizer, is that uh, reflected in the new budget for 22 in supplies or is it hidden in other costs? I follow your question. So there's certain items where we're trying to maintain a long-term perspective with the budget document. So if we know these are one-time fluctuations, uh, for example, with the bus transportation costs, we don't expect to have any savings next year because we expect to be running all the buses all the time. So we don't book a transfer for that. But with the IT department where there's been this added need for technical support like I was mentioning this year added one additional FTE, a full-time role. We know that that need is not going away. So for that instance, there is a transfer from the, the salary reserve line item to the corresponding IT budget. Uh, and then as part of, to keep track of any of those items where we're not booking transfers in the general ledger from a strictly from a budgetary perspective, uh, we have that document uh, that gets presented as part of the agenda at each finance subcommittee where we're keeping track of either savings or uh, shortfalls. Right. I'm not implying that what you're doing is wrong. It's just as no, long as it's documented. Uh, and we'll say a person like myself looks at the detailed part of the budget that uh, it would be obvious why you're transferring money from one area to another uh kind of done all the time in all the other departments yeah the historical if we are transferring money in any um, significant quantities um, we bring that to the committee so if we are moving if we're moving a hundred thousand dollars um, I should say, if it's, if it's moving out of categories. So if we're moving 100,000 out of supplies into personnel, personnel into contracted services, we bring that to the committee. If it's, we were gonna buy 50,000 worth of these supplies and it's now a different type of supply, if it's still in the supply, that doesn't necessarily come. There's an internal um, tracking control where the transfer is signed off by the in-person requesting it, goes through Kyle, I sign it, 
just for the tracking purposes. Uh, but anything that significant area of savings that's going to then go and pay for something different, those come to the committee, absolutely. And so one of the big um, uh, kind of collective ways we do that is that fall adjusted budget. So each fall, right, in March, we approve a finalized budget, then goes to the towns as approved. Depending on the year, remember last year, there was big buckets of money for settling contracts. Then when the fall budget was approved, that money was dispersed from all the various 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 series lines into those individual salary lines by school, by department. Um, this year, right? So when we get to a fiscal or a tentative budget in two weeks, Kyle will already have that level of detail in the majority of lines because those contracts are already settled. And so there's no, there's nothing we have to make any kind of, kind of uh, uh, executive session um, assumption. So that, that first uh, or the only adjusted fall budget does a lot of that reallocation. And you can see that line by line where money is going out and where it's going in. So that's, that's I would say, the biggest mechanism where we do nine times out of 10, that's, that's the only time we make any real large bulk transfers between lines. OK. Uh, when you were in the hybrid mode, was uh, every classroom used uh, in uh, the, the five uh, schools or, or were certain areas or sections of buildings uh, closed? No, so we have, so there, it, I would say it depends on the school, right? So Newbury Elementary School was built for a capacity of, I don't know the exact number, 700 some odd students. The role enrollment there is about 390 right now. So is every room fully utilized? No, um, they're used for different, spaces are used for different um, purposes, right? Not every single classroom is a classroom. There are um, extended day programs, um, but so we may had to make a decision when we shifted to hybrid, we could have brought more students back within existing space, right? So if we had space, we could have split classrooms up into smaller, um, uh, smaller cohorts that would allowed us, would have allowed us, I should say, to use that six foot distancing, bring more students back. But in order to do that, we had to add staffing. So in the, where we landed was existing staffing, existing space, and there are some spaces that are not fully utilized at the elementary level. Um, at the middle school and high school, um, spaces are, are more extensively used. Uh, there are still some classes at the high school. You know, you all went through high school just on the basis of high school. Um, even splitting the cohorts was challenging because if I have seven different classes, I might be a perfect balance in my math class, but then depending on how my English class falls in the schedule and rotation, it might be a 70-30 split with the students in, in what cohort they're in. So uh, there are some classes meeting in the library that are larger classes. So those students can be entirely spread out, eating in the gymnasium on the bleachers. Um, so the, the spaces are more widely used, um, but we weren't able to split up classes to bring more students in just because of the staffing. Um, and oh. I, you know, we've talked about that through the fall. I think there would have been definitely times where we, even if we wanted to add more staffing, we wouldn't have had the uh, people applying for the jobs. So in a typical classroom, what's the, the largest uh, number of students who can have in the class? Is, it, is there a, like 20 or is it like 15? No, no, no. At the elementary level, um, 13 to maybe 14 some classrooms. Um, at the high school level, I want to say high school tend to be more perfect boxes. Um, you know, at the round in Newbury, they're trapezoids. So um, um, in the more typical a standard classroom is between 850, 900 um, square feet. So a typical box 30 by 30 classroom, 16 with teacher space plus movement, you know, uh, to, to move or space to move around. Um, there are, like I said, there are some classroom spaces that are just larger and we're able to have a larger cohort. I was actually walking out tonight with uh, Megan Ober who is like the per literally any, the first week or two moving into hybrid, she's just a bean counter, 
right? She's like, I feel like a bean counter. Like her job is okay. This class now has too many students, too many. So it's either find a place in the building for that class to stay intact, or mm -hmm. two of the students need to change classes, which anyone with a high schooler knows it wreaks havoc on your schedule. Um, Eric is nodding. <laughs> um, so, right. So that's, it's, it's, it's a challenge, but on average, um, across the elementaries, 13, 14 um, is the max that we can keep that six foot distancing. And then again, um, at the at the other at the high school specifically, using libraries for larger cohorts of a more you know larger, uh, a more uh, enrolled core class or something like that. Hmm. It's a challenge. We'll say yeah, our our right there our um, principals have done an unbelievable amount of work. Um, they are literally, if they're not doing this, they're thinking about this uh, 24 hmm. hours a day. Trying to make this work, um, it is it is a challenge. We're doing some some very good things, as are the teachers doing phenomenal work. Good so work. there's 170 students less now because of, and is there a certain grade that is more like what can you identify where there are more students, less students, like in elementary now, or is it middle school or high high, or the uh, high school level? Um, a lot of elementary left to go to uh, homeschool um, and private schools, Clark School in Raleigh. So it's in yep. Raleigh, if you live in Raleigh and attend Clark School, I forget the discount, but it's cheap, right? They have the, the kind of the hometown discount. So mm -hmm. large number uh, left Pine Grove uh, oh. over to the Clark School or homeschool. Um, and then from there, it's pretty much kind of across all the grade levels. Um, but th the biggest chunk absolutely was, was out of elementary. And Again. kindergartners just not coming in. I saw the stats today that um, statewide, it's like almost 38,000 students that they're down overall. And they're estimating that 17,000 of those were either preschoolers or kindergartners yeah. that just held off this year. Yeah, it's just under 31,000. Yeah, so it's it's 8% uh, eight, eight mm -hmm. drop or 8, 9% yeah. drop in foundation enrollment in the state of Massachusetts. Oh, that's significant. You lost your audio, Brian. Oh, it's because I clicked mute. <laughs> um, <laughs> not sure what my hand is doing. Um, I'll pause there because one of the one of the changes is, and we've talked about it several times now, is that decrease enrollment. Um, the decrease in enrollment, mm -hmm. I, I think specifically, if you didn't unpack every single individual student, but that change from Rowley to Clark School. Um, was certainly a driver where Rowley saw the largest enrollment decrease. Uh, there is a movement, uh, I will say MASS, Mass Association of School Superintendents. Um, we, I met with um, the executive director, as well as a couple other folks and Senator Adam Hines, and there's some other uh, senators and reps who are interested in, um, we're proposing that we actually use either fall of 2019 enrollments or spring of 2020 enrollments. So there are three SIMS counts taken each year. There's an October, a March, and a June. The mm. October one of every year does become foundation and that's the driver for the next year's budget. So our fiscal 22 development is based off of October 1st of 2020. We know that that's a false number, right? That's a falsely mm. deflated number. So and Narissa pointed out last night very eloquently, we where this year Rowley sees a decrease. So that inflates Salisbury's and Newbury's assessment. If it all settles back in, like we assume it will to some degree, not perfectly, but largely settles back in, mm -hmm. that means that the following year, Newbury and, and Salisbury see a, call it a false deflation back down and Rowley gets absolutely whacked. So, there's, there's significant value, right? Certainly you're, it's the mantra that we've been talking about, a three or five year rolling average, remember that discussion, um, talking about the regional agreement and, and uh, changing our assessment formula and being creative and coming up with our own. I have some ideas. This uh, might help that. Yeah, right. So I think that you know it would have to be a statewide decision, but yeah. if that were to be the case, that would certainly, um, that would certainly help 
officers. That would change assessments, right? Well, that would level out assessments a little bit. Um, so we'll see, but I think it, it certainly, depending on how this plays out, as you said, Peter, could be a motivating factor uh, for future discussions. Um, but that's, I think hmm. there is, there's definitely, um, I will say more talk on January, whatever it was, 27th, when the governor issued his budget about an early joint resolution than I've ever heard. Um, whether or not that comes to fruition, we'll see. Um, but any, there's, there's clearly uh, an understanding that cities and towns and schools and certainly regional schools um, need an early decision on this. We can't wait until June uh, because this number, obviously we are the largest portion of your town budgets and mm -hmm. we can't really set a really accurate number and give you an accurate number until the state gives us an accurate number. So I'm hopeful. Um, Alice Peisch was quoted saying, we will not be late with this year's budget. Um, hmm. No other comment on that. Um, so yeah, so, uh, so overall um, that increase back to the, the what uh, Kyle summarized, it's a one point, roughly $1.3 million increase. Again, that will drop another 50,000. So call it a $1.25 million increase um, when we back off that charter figure. Um, so that is the cost of level services. That's the cost of doing business next year. Again, one more time, I'll say it, based on pretending COVID didn't happen and that we shift back uh, to a somewhat normal uh, September. So the next couple pages talk about, and I'll do this quickly, um, some strategic needs. Um, and these are, as I said, some born out of the pandemic, some a continuation. The first, not a new topic, not a new discussion. We talked about this earlier tonight. Uh, the second down payment, if you will, of universal free full day K. So this would add 75,000 and this would drop next year's full day K tuition from what it would have been this year. <clears throat> Instead of paying for full day K, it's uh, supporting half day sections, two of them in cohorts. Um, so let's just pause there. So the investment didn't go for no reason, right? So this year it actually allowed us without collecting tuition, uh, mm -hmm. it helped offset the impact of we're bringing kindergarten students in every day, Tuesday through Friday, because um, certainly we know it's a challenge to learn remotely, but definitely for our youngest learners. Mm -hmm. So all students are coming in daily, either an AM or a PM. Um, so Kyle talked about added transportation. Um, and so, so that certainly we're not bringing in any tuition, but that 75,000 down payment from the current year's budget uh, helped offset that program. That's, that's absolutely benefiting our kindergartners. Assuming we go back to a regular fall schedule, additional 75 uh, would keep us on track. Tuition would go from uh, what it would have been this year of 2000 down to $1,000. And then uh, if we can do that one more time in fiscal 23 by September 22, we are free universal full day K. Just to point out, we don't know it's a fact, it's not a threat, but there has been talk about legislation and we, we want to be on the right side uh, of this uh, transpiring. So if, if it does become legislatively required, because there is a very small handful of towns and cities left that are not using fully or are not offering full um, free full day K, and we know legislation passes the most easily when it's only a few people that get hurt by it. So we don't want to be in that group of people that all of a sudden has a $225,000 price tag that we have to figure out um, in, a, in a year or two. Um, so that, that's the, the first priority. Um, special education, this is a new program. Uh, we've talked in recent years and have added classrooms for the Autism Spectrum Disorder Program. A uh, handful of years ago, we had one classroom. Uh, a couple of years ago, we added a second classroom. Uh, over the past couple of years, we've added uh, behavioral specialists, BCBAs, and a third ASD classroom. Uh, we have uh, an emerging need for uh, currently three or four students uh, who have multiple, uh, multiple very complicated disabilities on the medical nature. Um, and so we are proposing setting up a classroom that would allow those students to be uh, to be educated within their community. Um, it would likely be at Newbury. I mentioned that Newbury Elementary uh, has the most available space. Uh, it also works well because it's the central school. 
So if students are coming from the other elementaries, it's, uh, it, it works universally. Um, so what this would be, it would be an, one staff member, one professional educator licensed uh, with severe special needs uh, licensure, uh, as well as some, some programming and supplies and materials setup costs uh, to establish that classroom. These students have IAs currently, um, so they would come with their IA. Um, and it's important to note that this is, as we talked about this last night, this is a, this is a must do, right? We, we put this in the section because it's not a have to do. Um, but if any one of these three or four students uh, were to be placed in an outside placement, it would likely far exceed, one of them would likely far exceed the $100,000 price tag uh, for setting up this program. So we believe the right thing to do because it's the right thing to do for these students is to set up the program internally. Um, but from, if we wanna look just at the dollars, uh, those, those three or four students could easily cost us a half a million dollars uh, if they were to be outplaced. So that is new so spending. Total is supposed to be 100,000? Total is 100,000. $100. Yes, it is. Thank you, Larry. It's missing a zero. So it's, that's a comma, but we're missing a zero there. Hmm. Thank you. Yes. We added a hundred thousand just for the record. I'm sure that wouldn't have slipped by you. Yeah, I appreciate that. And you are correct. <laughs> um, do any questions about that? I feel like that's a discussion we unfortunately have year over year um, for varying needs. Um, curriculum instruction, I won't go into this in great detail. This is actually an upgrade for our K through six math and focus. This brings us uh, the newest version of the program uh, and shifts us from a, you purchase the program to a true, uh, Narissa brought out the, the real phrase last night, the software as a service model. So it becomes an annual subscription. So there's a one-time cost of, of added $42,000 set up materials um, training. After that, it goes back to the, the set budget uh, overall. So this would be, uh, one of the areas that we uh, targeted to use those SR2 funds. So in the summary total uh, that we'll talk about in a second, this $42,000 is taken off the table because we're going to commit to that using those SR2 funds. Um, technology, there's actually two positions here. So it's a total of 156,107. Um, there is a technician and there is a, an instructional technology specialist. No, it's a technology integration specialist. Um, the long and the short of it is last year, we had a thousand less devices <laughs> that our tech department had to support. A thousand devices is a lot of devices. Um, add on to that, we've added cameras and um, jam boards and these things that I don't even know what they do yet, um, but some amazing technologies um, and one of the, again, let's go back to the silver linings of this, um, had so many conversations with teachers who have talked about, so excited to realize, I don't think they realized in all this, that this, this long-term commitment to a one-to-one -one initiative means that after the pandemic, we still have this in play um, and it's changing the way we educate students. Um, certainly into the future, we don't, we don't want to see them on the other side of a screen so we're not gonna be in remote learning, um, but having all students with a universal Chromebook piece of technology in their hands uh, is a significant um, step forward. And it was something that a year ago when we were getting ready to uh, pr uh, uh, present, Kim and the gang was getting Deb, we're ready to present the technology plan. It was a pipe dream. Um, mm -hmm. So that, again, silver lining uh, became a reality, but, um, Teachers are depending on this technology now more than ever. So we actually threw savings in other areas and um, some other, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, what's that line? The Treasure. contingency lines uh, were able to shift. We actually um, um, tempted uh, and contracted to bring a technician in this year. And over the course of the year, I'm moving that to a permanent position. So with it, this adds one more position to that. Um, and it would put one technical support person. Again, we're talking pure technical. How does this work? What do I do? This is broken um, in, on each campus. So the main tech department 
along with network administrator and data people, uh, data and, uh, support person lives on the main campus. And there'll be one technician because those other folks can help for the middle school, high school. Uh, but this would put one technician full time in each of the three elementaries. Because right now they're rotating around in the day that they're not there. Teachers are just like, please, I need Devin, I need John. You know, everyone, it's, it's, um, it is a significant need. So, uh, so that technician is 73,000. The second position, um, I, I think we talked about last night as a, um, I should say that 73,000 is a top priority. Um, the second position, technology integration specialist is absolutely a need. Um, long-term, this person in summary, helps integrate the use of that technology. I talked about teachers who are using technology in new ways. Early adopters, innovators who are running, sprinting with this technology and others who it's still difficult. Um, and so this position, uh, this individual would work with uh, all educators across the district to integrate technology so that we're maximizing the investment. Very, very well spent money um, this would be uh, but it's not as high a priority as that first technician, which is just <coughs> sure all those devices and all the technology is actually working for the teachers. Um, so collectively, that was 156,000, but the 73,000 uh, is certainly what we talked about last night uh, as a priority. Final thing, mitigation, right? We've talked about this extensively this year. Um, we know there is learning loss. There, there is no educator who will debate that, and anyone who tries to defend that um, doesn't have a conscience, because uh, there is no way that this is not having an impact on students. Um, so we need, to, we need to name that, we need to own that, uh, and we need to prepare for uh, doing what we can to support our students so when they come back in the fall, they're ready to learn. So the first two buckets, um, Kim spoke about that again, not feeling well, so isn't here to do that tonight, but uh, Kim talked extensively about the thinking and there's, we put this in as a placeholder uh, because we're not exactly sure how this will play out. Uh, at the middle and um, elementary schools, we're thinking about modules where a student can take um, a three or four week module in mathematics or literacy, depending on the grade level. And maybe it meets a half hour a day, five days a week for four weeks, but they could also be doing a math module in the afternoon and then maybe after that first four weeks, they join a second module and it's a different content, different level. Um, so we're envisioning this remote. Um, special education services will, will likely be in person on campus, uh, just based on the nature of the needs. Um, but we're assuming we could service in the vicinity of 100 plus students for each of the schools with this model and doing it remote in this modular format allows educators to commit and feel safe it allows students and families to commit and feel safe. And it allows families, if they have a cabin up north that they're gonna go hide in the woods, great. You can still hop on for a half hour in the morning, get your instruction with your teacher. Um, so again, that's not concrete. Um, have a lot of work to do with administrators and teachers to figure that out. Um, but we're thinking um, roughly 100,000 um, for the elementary and middle. And then at the high school level, about 100,000, and we're thinking that's more course-based. Um, so you've, you've heard the term credit recovery. Uh, nothing wrong with credit recovery. Uh, the better solution is giving students an opportunity to take a full course. So it'd be more of an intensive course. We're kind of envisioning that as a summer course. Maybe that uh, leads into the fall, um, but that would be outside of school hours. It would be extra and other, and it would give an opportunity for those students who, for myriad reasons, um, weren't able to complete a course uh, and pass it this year. So lots of detail to layer in behind that, but that, that $200,000 is absolutely brand new, right? That's a direct response to the pandemic. Um, and that's the second uh, chunk of funds uh, that we anticipate that we're, uh, as of last night, agreed that we're gonna earmark that uh, as part of those SR2 funds. So that's the 242 this 200 plus the 42 for the curriculum that we took off the top um, to say that's a valid use. It's one time. It is in fiscal 22, likely the, the front side of fiscal 22 summer and into the fall. Uh, but that is um, something we took off because it's a must do and we're gonna dedicate those grant funds. 
Mr. Walker. Brian, just out of curiosity, being an old elementary school teacher, you know, and understanding the concept of readiness and ready to learn and when does that kick in and on and on. But I mean, for a significant part of our students this year, especially in math, I don't think they're ever gonna get this year back. I mean, there'll be state testing ahead for these kids and everything mm -hmm. else, grade level state testing. How, how, how is the paradigm going to accept the fact that we could have lost a significant educative processing that could have been as long as a year. Mm -hmm. So um, I would say, I would say a lot to that. So let's take MCAS really quickly. So right now MCAS has been, the, the commissioner has committed to a slightly adjusted um, MCAS for the spring. Lots of details, not every student taking every test, piecemeal, um, different uh, graduation competency determination, allowing us to push off the ninth grade science. So there's some changes. Um, there's an expectation. If I call the Department of Ed and talk to them, the folks working there were like, yeah, MCAS isn't gonna happen, don't worry, we're gonna get a waiver. So there's an assumption now that administration has changed in Washington that there will be a waiver coming. However, the Board of Elementary and Secondary Education, which makes the decisions in Massachusetts is very, and let me say very, invested, James Pizer being the, the kingpin, invested in MCAS. They believe it is an important data point to see the learning loss. I would argue that that's not the tool that we need to, learn, to, to figure out the learning loss. The assessments that we do, the formative assessments that we're doing on, on, on real time basis, you can't do the MCAS in the spring and wait till the fall to figure out what happened. We need to do assessments that we have real time data the next day and, and adapt our teaching. So. So there's, so there's some work to do on MCAS and there's hope. It's another one of the legislative agendas for MASS. Um, the, as far as the, how we um, mitigate the loss, um, the second part of this, which I haven't spoken about yet, is uh, a health and wellness coordinator. Um, had a lot of discussions with parents um, and I feel like, you know, students are resilient, um, kids are resilient, um, but they have to be safe and they have to be healthy. And so there's a lot of work to do uh, to make sure that by the time we get to June or September, students want to come back. So we have to re-engage students so that they want to be sitting with us. <laughs> and right now, right, everyone's so excited this week to be back in school. It's a significant um, change. Um, so there are so many factors to this, um, but I, I believe this 200,000 is a down payment on the work that we have to do. If this is not, we don't solve this problem this summer. Well, we don't solve this would, problem next year. You wouldn't want, Brian, standardized testing to be insensitive after these kids have gone through a lot of different things that they could hardly understand what's yeah. occurring to them. Yeah. Because if you're interested in wellness, if a standardized testing system is geared to what it used to be in these times after this year, it's yeah. going to be hard on a, probably half the kids. Yeah. Yeah. And, and there's been some push to, if it happens, um, certainly there's not going to be any accountability, right? So the normal piece where they, they take the MCAS and they beat us up and say what we did and didn't do, uh, that piece has been pulled back. Uh, there's been some discussion to say, okay, if we have to do it, can you not report to anyone other than to educators so that we have the data, don't give the aggregate results. No. No. That's, not, that's not fair, right? I mean, no. so, uh, and then there are others that would say, you know what? I want the MCAS. I've been working hard. I've been well, working hard. Either that time. or you're going to have a lot of kids wanting to repeat a grade, you know? Yeah, so, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, not a lot yet begging to repeat grades, but it could happen. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah. So this is, so this, this investment of the, the 200,000 is short-term extended learning opportunities. Um, it's the start um, to a lot of work ahead. And then the final, I mentioned it briefly, but um, we talked about that last night. Um, we as a district have a lot of work to do in our overall health and wellness. Um, I believe it was Kim or someone else who mentioned that um, our current health and wellness standards, uh, and this is the Department of Ed's fault, um, have a date of 1997 uh, on the cover. 
So in the uh, 25 years since 1997 or 24 years, uh, a couple things have changed. Um, we are living in a very different world, whether we're talking about sexual health or, or mental health or you name it. Um, we, it is a different world. So um, we have a lot of work to do in our health and wellness curriculum. So this, this would be a long-term investment. Short term, certainly some uh, overall coordination that Kim spoke about, spoke about last night uh, in coordinating our efforts. 425 employees across this district, everyone working their tail off uh, to do their best on behalf of kids. Um, but we have everyone working, uh, doing what they believe is the best, uh, rather than an aligned and cohesive, um, very uh, deliberate path forward. And so we have a lot of work to do on that. Um, so this is a, a very important position. Um, again, had the dis difficult decision last night or discussion last night about, is it the highest priority? You know, for me, it is not. Um, it is a very important priority, uh, but I think that that short-term uh, instructional mitigation is the term. I don't know that I love that term that we use, but um, that, that intervention, that, that uh, short-term um, academic support to make sure that we are, are meeting students' needs. So Brian, do you ever talk to other districts, you know, to see, because it sounds to me like this program you're talking about, Jed, you know, to, to have, you know, modules to make up work should be something that should, you know, maybe that can transcend to this, you know, to the, uh, you know, uh, you know, Department of Education, that they might be able to have grants set up for that. So uh, maybe they can get money from the federal government for that. So that would make a big difference instead of you're just trying to save a pot of money that you have, it should be something that, you know, maybe networked all the, you know, the districts and different, you know, yep. schools and stuff, you know? Yeah, my understanding is that uh, is a topic of discussion for uh, what could be potential federal stimulus dollars, that that is one of the uh, kind of the buckets that they've, so rarely does it come down the pike. So the SR2 is fairly unrestricted. Um, uh -huh. everything else, the technology grant, the, you know, the COVID grant, the, the CVRF funding, it had to be specifically uh -huh. COVID related, even on the HVAC work, a lot that we did, they said, you know, it didn't qualify because it was preventative, uh, maintenance rather than actual yeah. COVID related. So, um, most of the buckets come down with some pretty specific, um, earmarks or from allocations. So that is one that I've heard many discussions about in districts or are talking about this now. Kim spends a lot of time, you know, we all spend a lot of times in our kind of a regional cohorts. We have a North Shore Roundtable um, and the assistant superintendents have a group and the superintendents have a group. And so that's, that's been a hot topic for sure. Um, and one of the things that MASS is certainly advocating for. So absolutely. So, so all in that, that the collective, those five um, was 673,107. Again, keep, I've said this several times, but we took 242,000 off of that. Um, so if we go to the other page that was emailed to you uh, late this morning, early this afternoon, this is, this is what it yields. Um, up at the top, we noted that um, we're assuming currently uh, a loss of 117,000 uh, in general revenues. So that's about 85, Kyle, in regional transportation, uh, about 25 in um, interest income. I'm assuming the towns are dealing with the same thing. That interest rate is wonderful if you want to refi your house, but it is not great to get any money back on the returns that you have in an account. Um, so dropping our uh, interest assumptions down 25,000, it's about 85,000 loss in regional transportation, and then about 5,000 that we lose in chapter 70. So the governor's chapter 70 figure, um, you remember we lost about $68,000 this year. We basically get that back shy of about $4,800, $4,900. Um, so the second, and I mentioned this already, that we know we talk about this every year, uh, the state sets your minimum local contributions. Um, everyone's minimum local uh, went down or required contribution went down. Um, 
that's based on a decrease in enrollment as well as all the other factors that we've uh, gone over uh, extensively. So um, the shift in enrollment, um, again, in the budget document um, uh, in a couple of weeks, we'll have all the detailed line items um, with all the, the prior enrollments and the changes, but uh, Newbury went from, uh, they're actually increased a proportional share. So they were, um, I think it was 28.69% um, last year. So they're up a little over a 10th of a percent. Uh, Rowley is down almost nine tenths of a percent in the uh, share of the district budget. And Salisbury is up almost three quarters of a percent. Uh, so we've talked about, we've the last couple of years, we've talked about Salisbury approaching 40% of the district share um, with this change in the enrollment um, Salisbury hit it this year. So again, this is an area that uh, there's going to be some advocacy and hope that uh, the state does something huge push um, across the state to to not use September or October of uh, 2020. Uh, any of the urban, you know, any of the urban districts where they they see significant money um, through the Student Opportunity Act, and that's largely uh, dependent on enrollment um, for various uh, calculations. Uh, a huge hit. So there is a big push um, to streamline the enrollment. So that would adjust uh, these these uh, proportional shares. Um, Salisbury is still the biggest, right? So it would be more like 39 rather than 40 or upper 39, up 39 plus. Um, so Salisbury is still going to have the largest percentage uh, of the increase. It's, it, it would be no drastic change, um, but it would provide a little bit of smoothing for um, for the three towns. So the first box, 1298977 um, we like to point this out every year. The actual increase in spending for level services is 2.92%. When you factor in the loss of revenues and the change for the towns, it nets a, a net increase to the town of 4.11%. And you can see that level services would be 400, just shy of 445,000 for Newbury, uh, a little over 150,000. Uh, for Rowley uh, in 821,000 for Salisbury. The high end, if everything else we talked about tonight, uh, netting off that 242 uh, were to be included, uh, that would be 1.73 million. That would be an increase of 569,000 for Newbury, 284.5 for Rowley in uh, 994,000 uh, for the town of Salisbury. So, um, We've done a lot of talking. So questions. Just one question, Brian, on that last figure, uh, the last chart there. How do you what's it? The, how do you explain the discrepancy between 1.730 as a preliminary increase and then the total down to the bottom of that chart of one, one eight four seven hundred eight? How do you explain that? The hundred seventeen thousand at the top. So, so. Remember on the, when you see the full budget document, we take the total bottom line, right? The total expenditure, we mm -hmm. net off our chapter 70 regional transportation interest income, and then the rest gets assessed to the towns. Yep. So we're increasing in that worst case scenario, 1.73. Then you have to add on the 117, same above, the 1.298 becomes the 1.41. So we have to make up that difference in the loss of revenues through chapter 70 regional transportation. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Again, so we'll say it one more time. This is, this is early. We just got these figures yesterday. So um, the kind of the areas still trying to, my understanding is, is circuit breaker isn't fully funded um, in the governor's budget. Uh, there's a question about the Student Opportunity Act, and we were, remember, we fought about this a lot. You were all with us on this fight that uh, we're not going to see the Chapter 70, so we want to make sure that special education transportation gets added into Circuit Breaker. It did get added in. Um, it was going to allow us to, to uh, claim 25% of the cost, add a new 25% each year, so it's a phase in over four years. Uh, so ultimately, that would bring us, we estimated, about 400000 uh, new circuit breaker dollars. Um, uh, regional transportation, we're guesstimating in the 73, 74% range. 
that's certainly something that we tend to have our local legislators uh, advocating on our behalf, and that usually ticks up uh, over the course of the budget development process. So there's certainly an opportunity that those gaps might be closed, that 117,000, um, as well as there was, there's an opportunity that some of those fixed costs, like that, that 1.298, that includes, uh, it doesn't include that $50,000 in savings that we learned about yesterday um, from charter schools. So there's definitely more tweaking that's gonna happen uh, over the course of into next week. And then uh, as we go to the, the tentative budget on uh, February 10th. Other questions, comments? So you're saying that there's talk of legislation that would change these, this uh, apportionment process from uh, using different enrollment dates? Is that going to be, in a, would that be in effect for the next fiscal year? It, it would be, yeah. So, if, yeah. so if, it's, if, it's not gonna affect these, this calculation here. I'm sorry, no, it would be, it would affect this calculation. So it's, it's short-term legislation, we'll see. It would have to be very fast-tracked uh, oh, okay. in order for that to be changed. Um, but it would be done through the budgeting process. So basically, just, it's not separate legislation changing laws. It's just basically within the budget process, changing how that minimum local contribution and, uh, is factored. Yeah. So, so I talked to a couple of people today. And um, basically, when, when the House and the Senate passed their budgets, they passed policy sections along with that. So the intent would be if they wanted to change something that would be actually part of the budget bill, but exist in one of those policy sections. And only apply to this year, right? And only apply to this year, that would be my understanding, yeah. Yeah, because statute requires October 1 of the prior year sets foundation. Yep. So, so that policy section, as Narissa said, would adjust it for the current year's budget as a one-time offset for the realities of what we're dealing with this year. So again, it would, it would smooth that a somewhat right? Salisbury is still going to be significantly higher. Newbury is going to be the second highest in Rowley, right? We know Rowley is going to have the best year this year, um, but it would, it would spread that out a little bit, um, a little bit more, and it would offset what we know or what we anticipate would happen in 23 when the enrollments in Rowley go back up and then Rowley would get hit and then Salisbury and Newbury would come down. So it basically smooths 22 and 23 um, somewhat. Okay. So historically, the um, Bruce in the, in the House and the Senate have added um, regional transportation and you know they've put monies into the budget to help us go up. Is that, are you hearing, I haven't been following it. Are you hearing at the state level that that that's not going to happen because of COVID this year and there's other priorities or is that still a possibility? So I don't know what Brian's heard, but what, I, I mean, this is brand new. So my, everything I heard today was that they're still trying to figure out where the numbers are at um, because the, it, it's particularly on the Senate side, they're the ones that typically do the increases. Um, they're always aiming for percentage reimbursements, but what comes across in the budget is dollar values. And it's not easy to get from those dollar values to understand what the percentage reimbursement that they usually, that they kind of benchmark um, their changes off of. Um, so my understanding right now is that there's people are essentially running around contacting DESE and DOR to figure out when you're you know, sitting there with a line item value of $25 million and there are maybe three different calculations that feed into that, how much is allocated to each calculation and, and, and how is that, um, you know, uh, what, what type of a percentage reimbursement are you actually looking at there? Um, so I, I don't think they know right now how far they, you know, off they, they, they would be. Um, but I, you know, I think that 
the Senate in particular, the House is a little harder because it's big. <laughs> um, but the Senate is a little easier. They're late in the process. Um, you know, I don't know how much more future revenue projections could affect them. But I think right now, you know, they're they're definitely seeing some opportunities. Some of them are already calling for, you know, more of an implementation of the Student Opportunity Act. And if they can afford that, they can definitely afford some additional regional transportation. Yeah, and what about on the circuit breaker? Same thing. Yeah, that breaks down yeah. in multiple ways. So it's hard to know because part of Circuit Breaker goes back to actually funding DESE functions and some of it's going out to districts and it's it's not easy, you know, until they have that breakdown and know exactly what it looks like, I think, to know where they're going. Like Brian said, we're kind of hearing that it's probably underfunded, but mm -hmm. it, it's... So we have to just wait and see. Yeah, so there's room. I mean, I think that's so that you remember Bruce appointed me to that whatever it's like a 72 different names transportation commission <laughs> oh i forgot about that yeah yeah it was good times so it was with it was co-chaired by alice peich and adam hines um alice is obviously education uh adam is not um that report was released and it said um how do i surprise that? nothing um it was literally no new information and it was this is being recorded, right? So, and I went toe to toe with Alice and she doesn't believe in regional transportation. Flat out, she said it, right? It's not fair that you get money and I don't. Wellesley, suffering. Um, so it's, it is just, um, Adam Hines, however, is a Senator and represents literally, uh, is it 40% of the square miles in the state? Literally, West, Worcester West, he is the only Senator just based on populations and enrollments. So his territory, it would take him a day and a half to drive around his territory. Um, super invested guy. Um, MASS is actually, I met with uh, Mary Bork, former uh, superintendent at Chelsea, is now legislative director for MASS. And we met with him today because we're saying, okay, so someone who has a lot of square footage as far as representation, um, again, Western, rural, not, not as much say, uh, but trying to, to build the understanding that it's small dollars to invest in things like regional transportation, rural school aid. Um, uh, but when we get behind, when the legislature gets behind that and those kind of funding mechanisms, you know, small dollars make huge impacts. Um, so, so I'm, I'm hopeful um, that this, that 117 um, is, is a worst case scenario. And likewise um, that our, our set costs um, may go down somewhat. Remember, if we get more circuit breaker, then that $200,000 increase for special education out of district goes down because circuit breaker is offsetting that as well. And I noted that if the Student Opportunity Act is funded in that circuit breaker um, funding is included in that SOA calculation, we would have gotten 100,000 this year and another 100,000 next year. So if they were to fully fund, whatever that means, that that could be another hundred to two hundred thousand dollars that would offset those out of district costs. So there's um, there's there's definitely room um, and definitely reason to continue lobbying our our legislators. So we're All right, good. are meeting uh, what's tomorrow. There's, Two weeks from tomorrow, um, North Shore Roundtable is meeting with all our legislators. So it's the five that we know, and then it, our, our uh, North Shore Roundtable goes as far south as um, Lynn, Chelsea. Yeah. Um, so it's it's a good, strong representation. Paul Tucker. So some names that were involved. Um, so we're hopeful. I know I've spoken with a few of our regulars, Diana and Elkhorst, and so I'm yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful. So that is there? Room. Is there also talk more talk about because when I was battling this at the MMA level, um, talk about aid, aid, you know, rural, rural aid um, rather than plug it with the education, they wanted to plug it with you know that way. Any more talk about that rural aid? So it's still a topic of discussion. Um, I know that we were originally I was involved with that because we were originally like a tier five, I forget exactly the coding, uh, rural aid. We are now not in the kind of the latest iteration of rural aid. We don't qualify. 
um, and would not receive that. So there is rural aid in the budget. Um, it's been included. It's not a huge amount of money and it's going to the, the truly rural districts. Out in the West, yeah. 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 So there is- So where does that leave us? <clears throat> Halfway between the middle of nowhere? <laughs> Sounds about right. So, oh. yeah. so I think, you know, I think it's, um, you know, our, our fights I remain the same. Regional transportation, fully fund circuit breaker. And as far as the Student Opportunity Act, we know we're not getting any new Chapter 70 funding. So we want, we want them to fulfill that promise of making sure that this um, circuit breaker uh, transportation is included. That's language within the um, Student Opportunity Act. Another one of the bills that MASS has filed is kind of an extraordinary relief for, um, for Circuit Breaker that if a claim hits $250,000, um, your reimbursement rate for the entirety of that claim uh, goes to 90%. Um, so it's kind of a high threshold. Um, we, you know, we've had them, certainly. I mean, uh, Dr. Bartholomew, the superintendent of Pentucket has talked about this. They've had six students hit that threshold in the last 18 months new students wow. so i mean that's catastrophic right when you when you have a million and a half right. dollars that you weren't planning on you don't you don't work around that <laughs> um so i think there's some 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 good targeted legislation that mass is working on um that isn't certainly there are folks who say you know anything over um, 200,000 pay the whole thing. And, you know, you've got to, we've got to take a measured approach. Um, and so make sure we're proposing things that you have to think like a legislator and understand that, um, you know, uh, laws have consequences and you've got to be able to fund them. So, uh, so certainly I think we, we stick with our mantras, right? We want regional transportation as high as possible. We want circuit breaker fully funded um, with that SOA transportation included. Those are the keys. Okay. Well, all right. Either. Well, when the pandemic hit, you know, everything changed. So I, I just, yes, I haven't had been watching that, but yeah. it'll come back again. It'll come so back well. up on the, <laughs> yeah. Brian, Thanks, Brian. With the, when, you might've said it, sorry, my brain yeah. is kind of like a student staring at a screen for so long. <laughs> I just days off, but no judgment and I here. understand why my son says he doesn't know when things are due. <laughs> um, so enrollment assessments, when did you say that that may get washed out as far as what that will look like? Um, I know you talked about that right now, Salisbury's at 40.08, but it could potentially, if we really look at what Raleigh will be in a year, and I truly yeah. believe that will be the case. Um, do we have an approximately approximate date? And again, I apologize if you said yeah, that. Yeah, no, I didn't say. I mean, it's, it is completely, uh, if it were going to change, it would be finalized with the budget. Right, so that would be approved uh, June 30th, technically, right? June 29th. So it could be joint resolution. So along with, and again, that's certainly on January 27th as this was being issued. There's, I've heard widespread chatter about a joint resolution. Um, so certainly that could be um, something that is early, uh, you know, an early joint resolution. But it would be whenever Chapter 70 is confirmed. It's a function of the chapter 70 formula. So that's when that would be official on that policy section of the bill. So that could be after we go to town meeting and vote on budgets. I think so the safest I, bet, yes. Yeah, I think they, they do know that it's time sensitive. I mean, I think everybody is very aware of that. Um, when Brian's saying a joint resolution, um, you know, so after the governor, the House has their go, and then the Senate has their go, and the House and Senate have to match. So they usually take those things to conference committee, anything that doesn't match. Um, with the joint resolution, essentially what they do is they say very early on in the process that the House and the Senate are going to match and that this is going to be their stance even before they get into the budget process so that we know that that's coming um, and we can work our budgets accordingly. And that would be my hope for what would happen here. But, you know, that they'd have to have, you know, majority votes in both um uh, both branches to be able to to be able to do that. So they need they need some consensus, I think, and they need to know that they have consensus to do something like that. I think that's what's part of what's going on right now as well. Um, so my hope would be that we know it sooner. Yeah. Sometimes we have. So that would be that joint resolution would be the only way that we yeah. learn it before town meetings, and then 
remember the whole uh, the this is more Desi regulation than anything else. If town meetings were to happen, and each of the towns approve the um, the assessments based on that the 28, 31, 40 percent uh, allocations, the towns. If then they did that smoothing, right? And so they voted the whatever June 30th of 20 calculation rather than October 1st. Likely Rowley's increase would go up and Salisbury's and Newbury's increase would go down. Mm -hmm. Our budget can only be approved if Rowley reconvenes town meeting and approves the increased assessment. Oh. Yeah. So as a general rule, everyone said why would a town do that? <laughs> so, right. I mean, logic. So in this case, there would, the only saving grace would be Rowley would be making a decision to incur a little more so that it's not going to be a major impact in fiscal 23, right? It's splitting it so that it's smoothing that it's addressing a little more in 2000 or fiscal 22. So that fiscal 23 isn't such a whack. Um, I mean, we are talking hypotheticals, right? I don't even know that this, this could be DOA, right? We, this could absolutely be dead on arrival in regards to anyone even wanting to bring up the discussion. Um, but it's a discussion with 31,000 student drop in foundation enrollment. This isn't just right in talking about this. The urbans are screaming loud and we know they get listened to, so. Jump at any time, Joe, and say that uh, we would reconvene. <laughs> <laughs> but then remember the next year larry you're hurting hard so you right. know and, and we will and, and then salisbury actually will be looking much better the following year so yeah. pay me now pay me later yeah, yeah I, I can say when we were, when these first numbers first came out we were seeing the, the final ones um in the the worksheets that uh, uh, the rest of the funding, you know, it, it kind of is what it is, but, but that gave me kind of the biggest, uh, this is what I'm going to lay awake at night thinking about is um, just what happens in the future, because I, I just feel like the backlash on that could be, could be really tough. So. What kind of backlash? I don't feel too tough. Uh, talking about having all those students come back, um, yeah. you know, next year, um, because that would cause everything to shift again. So, you know, obviously when you have a really hard year in your town budget, which an increase on the district side can definitely cause you to have, right? That makes it, that's not just usually rough that year. That's usually rough for a couple of years going forward. So that means that we're potentially dealing you know, or not us, but the, the assessment methodology is dealing multiple towns, really hard blows um, over uh, multiple years you know you, you would have an easy year this time but I, I can say in Raleigh I know of an entire um, neighborhood where I'm going to guess 70 to 80 percent of the kids went to Clark right and those parents are now paying those tuitions but it's I, it doesn't seem to be a long-term you know investment that they're going to make from the ones that I'm, I'm speaking with mm -hmm. so you know if those are all coming back then let me just go pull the numbers real quick. Um, so Raleigh's down 70 kids this year. Um, so if you have 60 of those come back next year and it just shifts everything back in the other direction, mm -hmm. that's going to be painful mm -hmm. in Cliff, the assessments. Did you realize that Clark, what they did? Do you, I, uh, I mean, so you mean? basically Clark offered any Raleigh resident, if they wanted to have their kids go to school all the time, $10,000 off their tuition. And quite frankly, if I had an elementary school kid and I lived in Raleigh, I'd be going, my kid would be going to Clark. No, I wasn't, I wasn't aware. Were you aware of that, Joe or Larry? I, that's news yeah. to me. I, I've seen their, their signs in front of houses all over town, but it didn't say anything about that. So. Yeah, no, and it's it's advertised all over the place. So I, I again, anybody I know who lives in Raleigh, their kids are in clock right now. So, yeah. um, and and the reality is, you they're still having to pay ten grand a year or whatever it is, close to ten grand a year to go. So yeah. are they going to be able to sustain that now for every year? Or then now when things come back, come back to normal, they say, okay, now we're going back the likelihood is a percentage of them will be coming back. Yeah. So 
clock really kind of shifted some things for Rowley. Hmm. Yeah, did. Well, another thing you have to uh, concern yourself about is that uh, I don't know what method Clark used as far as a hybrid or remote or whatever. They but full time. They those yeah. kids go to school full time. You can actually so do whatever you want at Clark. <laughs> but basically, mm -hmm. uh, Clark students are a year ahead of the Triton or PGS students. Uh, so why would a parent pull their children from Clark, send them to PGS? and basically uh, be a, a year behind. Clark is a year ahead of us, it sounds mm -hmm. like. Yeah. No, no I wouldn't say that's that simple true. a correlation. No. Yeah, no. no. I wouldn't say that's true either. Any, any parent that I have that's going there, they're basically doing what other fourth graders or fifth graders. But because you eventually realize you shouldn't be paying $10,000 to send your kid to go to school when you could go to a perfectly good public school. That's what will happen two years from now. People will be broke. Yeah. That's what will happen. Right. And I will say too, a lot of the families with multi um, school students um, that chose to send a younger student to Clark also chose to send older students to private school as well. So um, obviously Clark doesn't go that high. So they were looking at other private schools, but um, you know, it, it tended to be a family affair when it happened. Mm -hmm. Well, that's financially unsustainable for a lot of families over the long haul, over the 13 years. Yeah. So you will see it swing back. Right. But worth it for your kid to be in school full time if that's what you wanted. I could pay it for one year, but then after that, right. I'm probably going to go enough. Um, right. So that's what I mean. It's not right. sustainable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, and some of them are, because they offer all the modes, some of them are remote. Um, you know, I know families that are essentially not even living in state <laughs> currently, um, and they're attending remotely. And, um, you know, mm. but they knew that that remote model was going to be there where we were still settling ours, you know, coming into the into the fall because we didn't know what Desi was going to offer. We were still figuring out staffing and all that stuff was was still going on. So it was a sure thing versus um, you know not knowing for sure where we were at at that point. Do we know the impact of the number of kids that went to the IC? Um, because here are a fair number of people who also who are not Rowley residents that are pulled their kids for IC because they were doing in person. Mm -hmm. And no masks really on their playgrounds, by the way, driving by. There's no masks anywhere outside. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I would say in smaller numbers, but from anyone left from Salisbury or Newbury, that tended to be where they, where went. they went. I see. Yep. Same thing. And again, I've certainly have not talked to all, um, but those that I've spoken to, it was a, a stopgap. Um, as Ronnie was saying, I want my child in school full time. Mm -hmm. I believe they should be. I'm going to pay the money for the year. Uh, I'm, I know there will be people who, wow, I really like the IC. It's great and will stay. Others who I know will be coming back. So I think it's a, it is, it is purely a guess at this point. But that is definitely where they went. Yeah. A lot of the IC families, I don't think we're going to see that huge swing back mm -hmm. the way we'll see it from Clark. Yeah. yeah. Um, just, those families made a longer term choice when they chose the IC where the Clark, where I think Clark movers took a, took a coupon deal for the year. And when that coupon runs out, I don't know if they'll, if they'll, they'll pay the full price. That phrase and Narissa saying, what was your phrase? You be what you want to be, might be the two best descriptions I've heard so far tonight. <laughs> Yeah, so. <laughs> so I can say that the school committee kind of left it last night that um, we went through all this. I mean, obviously there's, um, there are some things in the, the um, strategic needs list that are 
concerning um, looking at things like that specialized program and the potential impact that that could have if we don't have a program like that in place. Um, and, you know, um, also the technology, I forget what the actual title was, the actual tech to support technician. technology. Technician? Is yeah, it a technician? IT technician? Okay. That's easy to say. <laughs> um, you know, and and obviously the the pandemic mitigation um, that we've already talked about um, potentially using some ESSER funds for. Um, you know, I, I think those are of concern, but we, you know, obviously we heard from you through the fall last year that this was going to be a tough year. So I think everybody on the school committee kind of wanted to come in either here be here tonight or watch the video afterwards if they had a conflict and um, kind of see where the towns are at at this point because obviously again like everything is uncertain um, there there's a lot going on right now that we know we're going to have to make up for um, down the road and I think we need to try and figure out the best way to do that and um, we kind of need to know you know where where you're at I guess at this point because you know, I don't know how finances have played out, you know, where your budgets are going, um, that type of thing. So any information you can provide so that we can take that and go back into our meeting on the third um, and really start having some solid discussions on the document that um, Brian and Kyle went through tonight, I think would be very helpful. Are you talking about now tonight, Narissa, or do you want us to yeah, no, I, I mean, I think anything you can provide tonight would be helpful. Um, we don't have another DCC on the books. Uh, I had actually looked that up before we um, hopped on tonight. So I don't know if we want to schedule another one in between, but I, I feel like um, I feel like this needs to be a very, you know, as much as I would love every year to be a cooperative process, I feel like this year has to be a really cooperative process to, to keep on having these discussions because this is, this year is, I mean, even, in some cases, week to week stuff is cropping up and, you know, we don't know what we're going to be handed next. It's been tumultuous to say the least. Yeah. So. When, uh, Newberry Finance Committee meets on Tuesday night. I don't have any um, sight line right now into the budget because we haven't had those discussions yet. But we do, I do know that we have a public meeting on, via Zoom on Tuesday night next week. Okay. And I know that we're getting started into the process. Yeah, I was going to say the same thing. We haven't started our budget process yet, but yeah, I don't um, know what. We're, we're yeah, going to start. I, I don't see this as going to be. I don't see this as a as a deal as a deal breaker for us. But again, I, we I have to look at it. And I'm sorry, I Neil. Go ahead. Yeah, I reached out to Tracy and Marshall this afternoon and gave them the two different figures for Newberry's numbers, the high and the low arc, and I haven't heard back from them yet. Um, and then also just among parent, parent chatter, the idea of those um, curriculum um, enhancements for the summer and the health and wellness, those are the two like of people who actually went in and read this document. Those are the things that they glommed onto as being a really... Um, great thing to hear after this year that has been so hard on students. So I can see that being something that parents might get vocal about, but just as a heads up of just what I've heard on the street or not on the street because I don't go out, but. <laughs> <laughs> on the side street, the dirt road. You know, yeah. hanging out with my, my, my uh, sophomore here in my office all day, but. The virtual street. <laughs> We should All just right. reiterate too the the discussion about the health and wellness coordinator. We talked about is there a way to use COVID relief funding as a one year mitigation, with the hope that we can figure it out in the future. But mm -hmm. the one year may still be <laughs> a need that we can get an amazing amount of uh, uh, benefit from 365 days um, with that coordinator. So that's another, and that's you know something like a coordinator. Um, an administrative position is very different in regards to how we can contract, right? So we, we talked a little bit last night about um, surveillance testing and, and going to be contracting with um, a couple individuals, public health nurses, to help us do some coordination. And that's great, right? They invoice us as a 1099 contractor. We can do the same thing with health coordination. Um, 
and it just gives us some flexibility in the short term. So that could be something if we can't figure it in the budget that I think there's some capacity that we, we've talked about prioritizing um, just the significance of the need that you said, Erica. Yeah, I think to Larry's point earlier, I mean, we're trying to be as flexible with this as possible, but you know, everything we're having to weigh and it's impossible to know the impact. So we're just trying to make the best decisions we can on where, where grants get used and um, you know, what programs we enter into and things like that. Well, I think you could use that COVID money for that, Brian, you know, like you said, for a one-time deal and put some money aside for the following year, because it, I mean, yes, there's always been a need for, you know, uh, social support in, in, in the schools, but it is just drastic now compared because of this pandemic. So to answer your question with Salisbury, don't ask me why, but Neil just left. So uh -oh. I, was it something I said? He, he, <laughs> text, he texted me and said okay. he had to leave. He had to, another appointment after he had to leave shortly after nine. So I know that um, we all talked and I know Chuck is still on here, but we all talked through email and, and Neil said he was going to reach out to you, Brian, just to mm -hmm. give you some feedback and what his thoughts were. Yep. So from Salisbury, we will trust that you and Neil have great conversations to know what, what, what our financial picture looks like. Yeah, I mean, I can summarize what Neil said was basically looking at those figures in the 800,000, right? He, he, and I don't want to speak for Neil, but you know, he, as he said, the enrollment is the enrollment, right? That's a reality. It's, it's Salisbury is becoming a larger portion of the district and that's not something we, we can change. And he was comfortable with that. Um, a million dollars would be very difficult were his words. Um, moving towards the 800,000 is something that is, is far more workable. Um, so I think, you know, certainly was no commitment, but that's, that was certainly his, he did point out that that, that upper end anywhere near a million dollars is going to be very, very challenging. Yeah, and that's kind of what he said. Salisbury's such a great place to live. We can't help it. Are all these families moving in? That's right. So, tough. Yeah, well, I'm glad he did relay that because he, I noticed he just logged off when we yeah. were on. He said goodbye. Tell him to stop the Salisbury advertising, okay? Yeah. <laughs> Cliff, or I don't know, did anybody want to? Oh, uh, our. The Board of Selectmen is going to be discussing this on uh, Monday night, and uh, we were actually talking about uh, uh, sending you a letter outlining uh, our situation. But I mean, basically, I mean, it, is, it has been a challenging year. Fortunately, our real estate taxes have held up pretty much, but that's our biggest source of revenue. But other receipts, uh, building permits, excise taxes, meals, you know, hotel, they're all down. I mean, we'll just continue with our process and, you know, I, hopefully we can um, meet at some point in between. I don't know if it makes sense to try and squish something in the week of before the tentative. I mean, I always hate, you know, we've talked about the tentative as a high watermark, that traditional high watermark. It's not legal, but it's just, you know, kind of the courtesy um, that the committee has done has been trying to set that, that high watermark in mid February. And I, I obviously don't want to you know, provide you with, I guess, a number there that um, that isn't informed um, as we're going through this process. So, um, you know, I think I think if there is information forthcoming in the next couple of weeks, that that would be helpful to know. And maybe that's just an email. Maybe that isn't even a meeting. I don't know how how you want to go about doing that. But um, but I'm I'm open to thoughts. I just want to make sure that those lines of communications are open in a um, in an appropriate way. I guess. Oh, Erica, I think we can handle it with a, an, e an email, do you? An email? I think so, yeah. I think okay. we can all, after we talk to Tracy and talk amongst each other, I think we'll be know a little bit more. Yeah. Emails work, sounding like that's a good option. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, all right. 
Um, and we don't, I don't think we had another date on the books. I look for ones just in the near, near future. Let's just see. Yeah, so. So is it the 10th of February is the preliminary and then 10th of March, is that the final? Yes, yeah, so we and have to have them certified by the 15th of each month. Okay. Um, so that's what we've done. Yeah, I'm just going throw it forward through um, through March and April, and we don't have any DCC dates on the calendar right now. We must have gone through the end of January and then said, we'll figure it out from there. Um, so um, so I don't know if it makes some sense if we're gonna do that by email to then kind of stick with our current DCC schedule and, um, and look at maybe the 25th of February. That would be with keeping the schedule that we're at right now. That makes sense to me. Does it? Okay. Yeah. Working for everybody. And we can switch yeah, off of so. a Thursday too. I was just kind of sticking there because that seemed to have worked for people. That's okay with me. Okay. I think it works. Yeah, I think I, I think a Thursday is good because rally meets on a Monday, Newbury meets on a Tuesday, school committee meets on a Wednesday. That left Thursday. And I and I think and I, it's smoother too when like Erica said when you know, Tracy start, you know, Tracy will talk to Brian, you know, there starts to be more communication and everyone's aware of it. Finance committee heads into it. We, we, we get a sneakling of what's going on. It, it becomes, yeah, we haven't even gotten our budget books yet. Yeah. 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 Understood. I, I feel like this is a weird year for everybody anyway, you know, yes, it is. <laughs> far <laughs> from normal. <For> sure. <laughs> so, okay. All right. Let's plan on the 25th at six 30 then. And um, and obviously we'll before that we'll have certified um, the the tentative budget out to you, so you'll have that. And if there's anything in between, feel free to drop an email. You guys know how to reach me. You know, know how to reach Brian, so we're here. Um, okay. For the record: right. Everyone knows how to reach me. <laughs> that has been made abundantly clear. Just in no case witness anyone was wondering. No witness protection program for yes, you. Definitely not. I was unemployed for a while, but other than that. <laughs> Did you have a lot of a lot of um, fraudulent claims, Brian? Yeah, Kyle had mentioned that earlier. I was among them. That's why yeah. I'm looking. But yeah, we've had about 125. So uh, there were like 10,000 in the state in that October push, at least in like a two-week time frame. Yeah. And <laughs> Talking to consultants, we like at first when it started dribs and drabs, we're like, oh my gosh, right? And he'd kind of, we're talking, are we, are we not protecting our data? But apparently <laughs> it's all tied back to huge data breaches, like likely international, like the TJ Maxx's, right? The TJX and yeah. all those big, big, bigs. So um, I don't shop at TJ Maxx, but <laughs> yes, I've had to do my own filing and whatever recovery and all that. So yeah, it's pain. Wow. There were yeah. like 12, 12 states that were really hit hard, and Mass is one of them. Really? So it must be something with state data, right? I mean, there's got to be something. 12 states hard. Yeah. yeah, but I know that the at the MMA meeting, there, there's, you know, cities and towns are really, are really Im impacted by that on their yeah. rating and, and it hits their budgets. And there was talk about policy changes. So yeah. the next so, meeting, I'll see what they have to say about that. I think I'm going to get appointed to that to that again. I'll know next next month. The board meets, board of directors meets at, at, on sometime in Feb February. My name was put up for it again, so I don't expect not to change. Change. So is we'll is see. that a, a congratulations or an apology that we owe you? <laughs> well, no, I I actually like sitting on that because okay. I I I push um I push my own stuff. Love it. So. Well, thank you then. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm the only one on the North Shore. It's awesome. I mean, the that whole North Shore. That's it. I think that's part of the reason why I got on it too, as well as that there was we were severely underrepresented. Well, perfect. So, if you're gonna yeah. if you're gonna fight for our local stuff, then I think you should stand for a long time. <laughs> yeah, exactly. 
We'll see. All right. Anything else? That was that was kind of the last of our agenda items, but I didn't know if there's anything else that needed to be talked through. Seeing none. All right. Thank you for your time very much tonight. And I just want to thank you, Marissa. Um, thank you, Brian. Yes. Thank, thank you. you. Everyone else. Thanks, Kyle. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Brian. Take care, Joe. Thank you.